creative just as everybody else has had to be creative during this time. And this was, the intention was to have this be live. And we had wonderful vendor booths and things to give away and great speakers, but like everybody else, we're having to pivot. So we pivoted pretty early and we realized that this is probably gonna be the case that we should be virtual. So here we are, we are virtual. We're so happy that everybody is here today. We are gonna record it. And so you'll be able to watch it later on. So if you have a friend that you think might be interested in some of the information, you can go to our YouTube channel and we'll put our YouTube channel in the chat box so that you can see it. But we're so happy that you're here today. It is eight o'clock. We'd like to start on time as everybody knows. Uh, so let me just start by saying, if you could see a little banner in the back, you can see my, my yard in the back too. You might even hear my dog barking, which that's just the way of the world now. Sometimes the dogs are barking in the background. Um, but my name is Cindy Cummings. I am one of the uh, people who is on the board for LT Senior Services. LT Senior Services, as you'll see, is designed as a Lake Travis resource to serve and engage aging adults and their families in the communities. And we do that in many different ways. We only work in the Lake Travis area, which is interesting. Uh, in that we wanted to be hyper-focused on our seniors who live in the area. And there's many things that we do, but the three top things that we do are monthly educational webinars. And if you've never attended those, we hope that you will. Uh, next month, it's going to be talking about Medicare and all the changes in Medicare. This is the time of year when you can change your plan and we have an expert who's gonna come and, and talk about that in a webinar. Uh, we're serving the needs of serving those in need. And uh, we have done some food drives. We've done food distribution. Uh, we are working with an Eagle Scout right now where he's looking at uh, food insecurities in the Lake Travis area. I know people think, you know, we're in a very wealthy area and that everybody has food, but food is a huge problem right now, not only for seniors, but for families. So um, we're happy to be able to help fill that gap. We actually got a, um, a grant from HEB uh, to help distribute food. And we've used that money in, in various ways. Uh, we've had different nonprofits who've come to us. We've reached out to nonprofits. We've done it all different ways. So um, it's just exciting that we're able to serve those in need. So that's one of the one of the things that we do. Another thing that we do is we connect seniors to services and products. And we do that via the Aging Well Expo. So for the Aging Well Expo, you're going to hear from different speakers who are going to have different topics that we feel are pertinent to uh what's going on right now. So we're super excited that you are here. Uh, we've got a little bit of time before our first speaker. So we're gonna do a little bit of fun stuff, tell you about the day and how it's gonna work. Um, so our day, we will have speakers from eight to 11 today. We have four, uh, four main speakers who will talk about all different kinds of topics. And then from 11 to 12, uh, from 11 to 12, you're able to pick up lunch and a goodie bag. And I want to show you uh, the things in the goodie bag. It's really pretty phenomenal. And these are all from people who are members of LT Senior Services. We actually have 40 members of LT uh, Senior Services. And if you're a nonprofit or you're a business who specializes in working with seniors and you want to really help the seniors in the Lake Travis area, you can become a member. And you can find out more information about that at our website, ltseniorservices.org. Um, but just to show you, let me just pull out some things here. Oh, I'll pull out mine first. This is my husband's idea. Um, he said, why not give a scratch off to everybody? So I've got a scratch off and all the bags. I would love to hear if you win big. Maybe you can take me to lunch if you did. Um, but anyway, that's in all the different gift bags. Um, Lake Travis Aquatic Center gave us these little sticky boards. Uh, there's lots of information about the different groups. I'm sorry, this is noisy. I'm just cool. This is how big the bag is. It's really crazy. Well, first off, you will not want for a pin. Let's just say that there's many, many pins in there. Taylor Scott and White gave us some hand sanitizer. We have this uh, from Arbor Terrace. It's a magnifying glass, so that's pretty cool, especially if you're going into a restaurant. It even has light. Uh, Care Patrol gave us a whole little packet of fun stuff. The Arbor gave us, you put this inside your car um, and then you put your drink on top of it and it will soak up some of the water in your car. Um, I've got something that I've got to open. Uh, we've got pads of paper. As I said, we've got different flyers. 
You have our directory. So this is the LT Senior Services directory. We print these out as we get new members. Uh, if you want more to distribute to family and friends, please let us know and, and we'll get those to you. Senior News gave us a newsletter. Lakeway Residential Phone Book. So if you didn't get a phone book, we've got a phone book in there. Uh, we have a uh, coupon. If you're having trouble getting sleep uh, from UT, UT has a whole program on sleep and restless leg syndrome. And they gave us some really good handouts in here. They actually were a speaker for us this year. And it's really fascinating what they're doing. This says receive up to 300. This is not get $300 off. Um, if you were to participate in a sleep study. So it's super cool. So we're thankful that they thought about adding that for us. Um, a lot of marketing materials. Here's a starter conversation kit. This is from, uh, this is from Hospice Austin. And one of the representative, well, I can't even talk, representatives will be speaking. And so this is a great handout too. A senior resource guide gave us a great directory. Age of Texas gave us some stuff. Um, this little come for care gave us a little ball. Like I said, there's so many pins. I can't even tell you about all the different pins. And then Sweet Sensi, they, um, they distribute CBD and I'm so excited. They gave us a candy, little candy, a capsule. And then they have release, Relief Salve. Is, is that how you say it, Salve? And Sweet Sensi, I'm not sure what this is. But anyway, a whole bunch of CBD stuff, which um, I don't know if you heard, but I had my knee replaced. So I could be using some extra help. I'll be rubbing and eating some of this later on today. We wanna to thank them. They went to a lot of trouble to do these gift bags for us. So thank you everybody. Again, welcome. It is about 8.07. I'm not sure if Brian is on. Oh, what else should I talk about? Uh, Natalie, am I, am I skipping anything? Of course, we have to thank the Arbor for the lunch. I mean, that is just phenomenal. Um, that they have provided the lunch for us today. They have been really great supporters. Let me go ahead and pull up, share my screen on that. We were gonna do the first two door prizes. Oh, that's right, we're gonna do, thank you. Um, so can you see the Arbor's slide here? And Natalie, I'll, I'm gonna count on you to tell me. Yes. Okay, cool. So the Arbor is an assisted living and they also have uh, dementia care and you can schedule a tour for them right now. They're being really creative about how they're getting people in and helping them to see the facility or the community that they have. It's a great community. They've got a pool. Um, they just went through a huge remodel and I know they were probably gonna have a big old gangbuster you know, party, but a lot of things have changed. But if you are interested, we always encourage our clients to check out all the different communities and to see which community might be better for them based on their level of need. Their level of need, like I said, is assisted living and dementia. And we're just, we're so grateful that they shared, um, shared lunch with us today. They are gonna make, um, they're gonna make a hundred lunches and we don't know if we'll have exactly a hundred people come through, but they have been donating food to the community. So they've been very helpful to, um, our first responders. So again, we wanna thank the people at the Arbor. They have been awesome. And let me go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and pull open a screen again. Uh, I feel like a DJ when I'm doing this, it's just so funny. Uh, the next screen that I'm going to share is the library screen. When me and Natalie were practicing earlier today, I actually uh, went out and turned off my computer. So that was fun. So we've had a fun day technology wise. I have heard that it is a full moon. Um, so there you go. I'm looking for the library. So I'm gonna go ahead and share their screen. So they're, uh, they have been a great partner of ours. We couldn't have done what we're doing without um, Without the library, they have a great way of publicizing the events. I can get in there again. Maybe I'm not so good at DJ. I'd rather be in person. I think all y'all would rather be in person. Oh my gosh, I'm saying all y'all. I'm not even from Texas. It's crazy. Uh, can you see it? So Lake Travis Community Library, they gave us a bag of books. 
and the bag is in itself is wonderful. It's a really heavy bag that of course, uh, I think there's six to eight books in each of them. So Lake Travis Community Library, they have curbside reserve pickup. So it's crazy. You can actually reserve your books and then just drive through and pick up your books. They have had homebound delivery for a long time via their um, bookmobile. So um, you can you can have people, if you know people who would really benefit from having some books delivered, help them get set up and the books will actually be delivered. They've actually helped deliver and distribute some food uh, to some of their clients too. So uh, technology help, they, you have the ability to contact them and get technology help. And I think that's phenomenal and that's all free. It's just volunteers. So thank you. Our first winner is, we're going to get this down before you know it, is JP. So it's, it's J Price. We weren't going to say last names. We just thought maybe we shouldn't, but it's kind of hard to say JP um, because who would JP be? So JP, when you drive through and you get your lunch, you will have your gift bag there and your gift bag number is, oh, I think I did it wrong actually. Didn't I, Natalie? But we'll just move those around. Um, so your gift bag number will actually be I'm looking on our list, number six. You will ask for number six. So that's our first raffle winner. Our second raffle winner is from First Light Home Care. And let me see if I can pull theirs up. And uh, they got a bottle of wine. And we want to thank First Light. First Light is one of our members of LT Senior Services. And they have been a great member supporting us in lots of different ways. We really appreciate everything that they've done for us. And let me see if I might be sharing. We'll see, maybe not. So this is First Light Home Care. And Natalie, again, if you could just tell me if you can see it or not. First yeah. Light Home Care of Austin. At First Light Home Care, the genuine health and well-being of others is our greatest concern. We vow to provide first class service for our clients so they may enjoy um, warm independence and relaxed comfort in their own home. So our winner is Pamela V. Pamela V, you have won. So when you drive through, if you would just ask for your bottle of white wine and you are raffle winner number two. So Natalie, if you would start record, if you haven't done that yet, that would be great. And then if you would bring in Brian so that I can introduce him. So Brian is our first speaker and he's going to be talking about Zoom, which is very appropriate because we're all now using Zoom for family, friends. I have a weekly meeting with my sorority sisters from Oregon State. So it's amazing how Zoom uh, are keeping people together and also helping uh, during this time with just social isolation. So Brian's going to help us out with some Zoom tips and we're so glad to have him. Natalie, do you see Brian? Is he available? I am calling him. Oh, she, she's calling him. Okay. Okay. So Brian, let me tell you about him, what she calls him. He is a senior's historian, and he discusses the three top senior gifts for others. His first one is your life story video, which is your favorite stories captured for future generations, and his tribute video, which are remembrances about a loved one who's passed, and then a thank you video for caregivers. Brian records all of his interviews remotely. He used to do it in person. He was doing a big project with several different senior living communities, but now he's doing it remotely without coming to you. He uses a video phone call over a senior smartphone. Brian then asks a list of questions chosen by the seniors in advance. It's a great tool for Alzheimer's patients, like a picture book on video, and you can see more of his examples. Natalie, would you mind talk, uh, typing in his website? So his website is www at Brian Hill Online. Brian supports the Oral History Institute at Baylor University. Brian, we're so happy to have you this morning. How are you? Hi, Cindy. It's uh, it's great to be with all of you on uh, on a chilly morning. So I've got my my warm uh, duds on here. You look uh, very fallish. Very polish. Well, well, we're yeah. so happy you're here. And without further ado, I'm going to go away and uh, we're going to let you take the stage for about the next 15 ish, a little bit more minutes. And okay. without further ado, Brian, you have the stage. So um, I believe that you're set up to share your screen. Let me know if you have any problems with that. I see it on here and I think I can uh, share it uh, pretty well. And uh, let me see. Do, 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 do. Well, I, I just want to say good morning to everybody. And I'm going to. Uh, 
do a little uh, test of sharing my screen here in a second. Uh, let's see, uh, host has disabled participant screen sharing, Cindy, so you need to know that. You need to uh, uh, let me share my screen. Um, and I guess you could call me, folks, I guess you could call me Mr. Mr. Zoom. Good, Brian. <laughs> there we go. And uh, I, I use Zoom in a variety of ways. Now I can share my screen. Thank you. For example, I can share that uh, there's the email that I got reminding us about when this uh, program starts. And uh, to join it, uh, that I could click right here to join from a PC, from a Mac, from an iPhone, from an iPad, pad, uh, from an Android device, almost from anything. Isn't that great? So uh, I have uh, the honor of, uh, well, dealing with technology regularly, and as Cindy was saying, I, I use Zoom uh, to broadcast right into uh, the uh, Belmont Seniors Center, and I do uh, discussion groups, and I can hear them, they can hear me, I can time what they say, and let them make sure nobody goes too long, and also I can uh, I do uh, private interviews with people about their life stories, and I record that on Zoom. Now, something like FaceTime, where you have an iPhone, and you connect one to one is okay. It's very easy to use, but you can't record it. Can't record it. I can record it because I have a Mac computer, but most people cannot record from uh, an iPhone. But on Zoom, you can record just like this is being recorded right now for everybody to enjoy. And uh, so I use uh, Zoom in, in different ways that I never thought I would be doing, but thanks to COVID-19, we all innovate. You who are watching this know how to get onto Zoom, but you deal with the same problems that uh, how many of us do with people who struggle with Zoom or struggle with technology. Uh, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's your mother and father. And uh, I want to know that you're, you know that you're not alone and that this kind of, um, well, struggle is something that's uh, normal for people. And I want to go and uh, play you a short little uh, comedy video for a second. It's gonna only last a couple of minutes. And, uh, and it will discuss uh, just the kind of problems that you can have uh, communicating with somebody about Zoom. Uh, and this is a, a man trying to communicate with his father. So let's take a listen. And he'll begin here in just a second. You also have closed captioning on the screen. And it's just uh, loading up. Zoom is good for sharing a screen. Uh, sometimes videos pause for a moment, but then they go again. Here we go, I'm pressing the play button. Dad, don't you see the link? I'm looking right now. I don't see it anywhere. Are you looking in your text or emails? Text. I emailed it to you. Do you see it? Oh, okay. I see it now. But it's not doing anything. Did you click on it? No. Okay. Go ahead and click on it. It's saying it wants access to my microphone and camera. Click OK. Are you in? I think so. It says it's using my computer's audio. That's good. Can you see me on your screen? No. Are you looking at your computer? Oh, okay. There you are. Okay, I'm going to hang up the phone now. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Do you have your camera on? I think so. I don't think it's on. Why would it not be on? I can't see you. That means it's not on. Well, how do I turn it on? And why can't we just talk on the phone? We'll be able to see each other on the big screen this way. Now, there should be a camera icon on your screen. Just click that. I don't see one. Just move your mouse. One should appear. What's it look like? A camera. It should be in the lower left side of your screen. Got it. I finally found... I can't hear you now. I think you hit the mute button. Hit the same button again. Okay, got it. Now can you see me? No, but I can hear you now. Click the camera icon just to the right of the mute button. Oh, I see it now. Wait, the damn thing just disappeared. Move your mouse and it should reappear. 
Why would they make it disappear like that? I don't know, but if you just move your mouse, it should reappear. Okay, I see it now. Now can you see me? Yeah, but I just see the top of your head. Can you tilt your screen down a little? How about that? It's too low. You should be able to see a video of yourself in the little window. Use that to position your camera. I just see the video of you. How about that? Is that better? Not really. In the upper right part of your screen, you should see a galley view option. That'll let you see yourself so you can position your camera. I don't see it. <laughs> okay, just tilt your screen down like two centimeters. Okay, how about that? That's, that's great, Dad. How have you and Mom been? How do you turn the volume up? Uh... Found it. Dad, you just turned your video off. What? I can't hear you. You turned your video off! I can see you! There's a camera icon if you just... Well, you have seen it, you have felt it, and uh, the moral of this story is you're not alone uh, in uh, struggling with uh, something like this technology, that's for sure. Okay, so I'm going to uh, close out of this video and, uh, and also tell you that I have some other treats for you today, uh, things that you can do to uh, improve uh, your communication with others. Uh, about Zoom, and uh, in my opinion, one of the the best uh, introductions to Zoom, to somebody who is resisting going on Zoom or, or find it very confusing, or a senior especially, somebody who goes slow and explains things, uh, is this video, uh, which I'll provide to you in a link if you send me an email at the uh, end of our conference here today. And, uh, well, let me show this to you in full screen with some closed captioning. Hi. If you're joining an online video get-together on Zoom for the first time, it can feel intimidating. So we thought to put together a step-by-step -step guide, especially if you'd like to join us for our free Ask Cozy Grammar online video Q&A. Hey, Brian, we're not seeing the video. We're seeing the old video. Okay. If go ahead and unshare uh, the one video and then share again. All right. is simply to search your email for the link to the meeting. It will be under the words, join Zoom meeting. To get started, and here we go. And here's the, uh, the, link. the nice, calm Mr. Rogers-like uh, presentation the that I'd like you to take a look at. So you can Let's get everything set there. up without feeling rushed. There we go. Here's how to do it. So you'll find the link. So what I like about this video is he Zoom circles meeting. what you're supposed to be watching. You're using Zoom directs your attention time. to a certain portion Opening of the screen link is a nice calm demeanor too. Uh, the program to be downloaded to your machine. Uh, I also recommend happen, that you use closed captioning because not everybody can hear that well. Uh, and uh, uh, that in allows you to cases, watch the words, hear the words, and then look for that yellow encirclement uh, there on the screen. Click a link that says download and run Zoom. The same process so because Once we're a little pressed for time i'm going to say uh that is a terrific video that i recommend that you try and take a look at and i'm going to show you some other ones as well it shouldn't take too long so it's back to me now and, uh, and then you can join i'm using meeting. that share button now on notice, the screen which is uh, which is really nice to, to join the meeting automatically and it's a powerful case, tool if you're a teacher if you're a presenter or if you're wanting to explain something to somebody to do. So uh, I'm uh, going to be uh, showing you uh, an email that you can ask for. And let's see, how to zoom. That's right. And I'm going to go back and share my screen so you can see uh, the email that I will uh, make available to you if you send me an email. Um, we played a comedy link. We talked about the cozy instruction on how to join. Uh, a first time Zoom call, it lasts about six minutes. I'm gonna show you a cozy instruction on how to host a Zoom meeting. Uh, it's 20 minutes long, and I recommend that you uh, you try that one out. And it is a very calming, very uh, slow presentation, and uh, I can show it to you 
here on the screen. Just by clicking that link in the email that I'll s send to you, you, to you can take a look select at Select optimized like screen that. for sharing a video clip, which also selects sharing the computer sound so that your participants hear what you can I hear. I really like that yellow so circle where he directs your attention to what you need to be paying attention to. Show you how to set those to. chat settings. And here we'll take some questions at the end of this as well. Um, th these are all free, these videos. And this particular video starts off in a very calm and, uh, you know, a, a very peaceful way uh, that uh, is designed not to intimidate people. The little circle on the screen means that video is loading. I had it preloaded at the at a middle point and I wanted to bring it back to the beginning. I took my little slider and just put it back to the beginning and it'll be starting here uh, shortly. Hi. I'm Thomas from Cozy Grammar. If you find yourself needing to host a Zoom meeting for the first time, it can be intimidating. Even if you've joined a Zoom meeting before, getting behind the scenes and making things go might feel like another kettle of fish. And so, since several viewers have asked us to do so, we've put together a cozy step-by-step -step guide. Join me inside my writing yurt and we'll get started. So I'm gonna pause this video. He has a writing yurt. Yes, that's right. We all should have writing yurts, shouldn't we? <laughs> Isn't that oh my great? Goodness. Hey, <laughs> you wanna stop sharing that screen? And Brian, we've got a couple more minutes. Could I just ask you some questions? Shoot. About Zoom. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my video. So, um, you know, we had to become experts immediately in Zoom because we were right, taking sir. our events um, from being live to going online. So we had, I am by no means an expert. And the fact that you had trouble just says, hey guys, every time we log on, we have some kind of problem. Earlier this morning, I actually hit the wrong button. I closed my computer down. So things like that happen to us. But what are some, uh, just some helpful hints if you're getting onto Zoom? Could you maybe tell us about some of the features? I know when I pull my mouse down to the bottom, you know, there's different things that you can choose. Do you want to kind of tell us about some of those things? Sure. In that first video that I played uh, for you where it was calm and peaceful and he was uh, describing things, he describes all the little buttons at the bottom of the screen that are on there. And sometimes you go, well, I'm never going to use that, but it's useful to know what, what they do. You can shut your mic off. You can shut your video off, just as I could uh, do right now if I chose to. Uh, you can. We have 31 participants on this call. We can see how many of them there are by looking down at the bottom of your screen. You have a chat where you can chat privately off to the side. You can share your screen. If you're an instructor, that's a very powerful tool. I was able to play some videos for you, add closed captioning, take them off. You can record your conversation. I use that when I interview people about their life story using Zoom. Zoom records that, and then we post that to YouTube so you can have it for future generations. And then there's a, that uh, leave the meeting button off to the side. Uh, the, the pause your video is nice if you have to go get a glass of water or go to the bathroom or do something like that. Uh, when you pause it, I can uh, pause mine. It goes to my uh, profile picture or the description of me, and that's a nice sort of private thing. You can still listen to the meeting, but you can uh, choose to have that up there instead of the, the picture of the video. The uh, third uh, picture, uh, third link in the four links that you can uh, get uh, actually um, goes and gives you a, uh, uh, a v sort of higher end uh, description of how to host a meeting. So you've got uh, how to join a meeting, how to host a meeting, and you just need to send me an email at brianhillaustin at gmail.com. And then uh, you can uh, just get that email, try out those links, and they're, well, lovely tools for you to use when you're trying to communicate with uh, a coworker, a loved one, a senior in a facility, uh, and explain what Zoom is and how helpful it can be. Great. Well, we've got a question from the audience, if I could ask sure. you. And uh, everybody, if you have questions, you can either post them in chat or question and answer. Either one will be monitoring them both. But the question is, we as listeners can record the Zoom meeting. So today, could, could the participants record the meeting? That's a great question. 
the host can record the meeting. So the person who starts the call, the person who sends out the email to you uh, can, uh, can uh, start that. And the host has a lot of power. <laughs> so the host can decide that uh, they want to turn your microphone off, uh, turn everybody's microphone off. And that's helpful too when people are beginning a meeting and it's all confusing and cluttered, or there's a noisy dump truck outside of somebody's window and you don't want to hear that, uh, the host can shut everybody's microphone off except theirs. The host can record the call. Uh, and if you're just doing one-to-one, -one, well, the person who started and sent out the original email can record the call between just two people. Or in this case, we have those 60 people watching. You can record all that in, uh, in Zoom and play, have it play back later. Excellent. And we're supposed to have um, on, close to 100 people on the call. So oh, we did think, yeah, we did think people might uh, be joining in. So um, we do, as the host, I can see the participants, but the people who are participating cannot see, which I think is good. You know, they can't, if you'll and share your screen, Brian. Um, I think that's good that, you know, they have that privacy ability. Uh, so we are recording it and this will be put on our YouTube channel. So if you, again, if you want to share it, it's sounds like the only person that can record is the host. So participants in any call can't record. Is that right? There's just no way for them to do it. You know, not that I know of, but let me just uh, do a little test at my end right now. And I pushed a record button and it says pause, stop recording. So perhaps I can record it too. You'll now get that. You, but you're a panelist. So That's you're right. a higher, we have kind of a hierarchy uh, yeah. because we have upgraded to the webinar version. So we have more than the meeting version. So as panelists, I guess you can record, but that would be interesting. We'll have to check that out. That's a great question. Good Mary question. always has great questions. Um, I don't see any other questions. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you, sir. And please reach out to Brian. He has a great program, both for social isolation right now for seniors, uh, having this ability to record some of their life memories. Um, it's, it's a great process for them to go through during this time. It's a great we gift for, for other family members. It's you a great that, gift. Uh, for them. And, uh, and also broadcasting into the seniors' facilities using Zoom, where we can have question and answers. I can hear them, they can hear me, and uh, we can have a full Socrates Cafe discussion. But please just send me an email and you'll get a link to all, every one of these very helpful videos. Thank you so much, Brian. We okay, appreciate bye -bye. you. Brian is also a member of LT Senior Services. Uh, so I see Dr. Norma Perez. So Dr. Norma, thank you for coming today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. Um, without further ado, you are a licensed clinical psychologist with over 20 years of experience. You obtained your PhD at the University of Rhode Island and completed your clinical fellowship at Brown University. She has a private practice in Lakeway for nearly seven years and provides individual and couples psychotherapy as well as, well as psychological assessments. When working with her clients, she looks at the big picture. She looks at why they saw her out and then also assesses other aspects of their life, such as their social and family life, their health issues, and their functional abilities. She believes that when one area of a person's life is off balance, it most likely affecting the other areas of their life. She strives to help her clients improve their overall quality of life, not just with the pre presenting issues. Dr. Perez works with older adults in her office online and by phone, which is fascinating because I know your work has greatly changed with that and in their home. She helps adults and their adult children navigate the challenging changes in their relationships. What? We still have challenging relationships even as adult children? Imagine that. On a personal note, she's married to a wonderful husband of 40 years, has two beautiful daughters, two handsome son-in-laws who combined give her three handsome grandsons. She enjoys gardening, hiking, and spending time at the beach. And Norma, right now you are muted. So if you will unmute yourself. And I know you have been instrumental in uh, being able to provide care um, remotely. And uh, isn't that right? You have yes, been- Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and we're so happy that you're part of LT Senior Services, and we're just really interested to hear what you have to say today. So I'm going to go off video, and if we have any questions, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask them as we go through at the very yes. end. All right, take it away. All right, I am uh, going to uh, share my screen, so give me a few minutes to bring that up. And there it is. And from the beginning, 
All right. <clears throat> so I'm sure many of you did not expect to be still socially distancing and kind of isolating all these months into the year. I don't think any of us expected to still be in this situation, but we are. And so, and excuse my voice, I'm getting over some hoarseness. Um, but, you know, uh, we still are in this situation. And some of us keep holding our breath, waiting for, you know, the, you know, the next week, the next month. And in the meantime, we've kind of gotten stuck in a situation where we were kind of holding our breath, staying at home or limiting our activity, thinking, okay, I can do this for the short term, but it's been quite a while now. And when you do something that's not really healthy for a long time, it starts to affect us. So I really want to talk a little bit about the effects of COVID-19 on our mental health in general. Okay, so you may not realize that there's some hidden health risks of COVID-19 with us do doing more fewer social, having fewer social connections uh, and feeling more isolated, we're, that increases our risk of chronic diseases, of psychiatric disorders, and even the risk of premature death. We're actually seeing some of that in the nursing homes when we had so many restrictions on being able to see our loved ones. But we also have to remember our loved ones that are at home that maybe are not in a facility, but yet don't have the ability to get out as much. And we need to really recognize their risk. And, uh, and, and as you're going through this presentation, not only think about yourself and your situation, but of your uh, friends and family and keep them in mind and, and try to think about how you can help them. And some of the other hidden risks are when we have few frequent and meaningful social interactions and stimulation, then we have uh, an increased risk of cognitive decline. So if we're not using our mind, our mind kind of goes limp, it, it atrophies, and we stop learning how to uh, exercise it and think fast. Our processing speed slows down. Um, our ability to kind of uh, incorporate our environment around us and react quickly declines. And so we've got to keep in mind that that is a significant risk. Also depression, anxiety, and even suicidal thoughts. So you may understand anxiety and uh, depression, but what we're seeing more of is people kind of thinking, okay, I'm kind of done with this. Um, either their depression has gotten so bad or their anxiety, and it's uh, become very difficult to tolerate that distress. And they uh, get a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. So, so those are really serious concerns. We need to be on the lookout not only in ourselves, but kind of inquire the ones around us, reach out and um, assess your, your friends and family. So I wanted to put in this self-assessment because I want us to ask ourselves, a lot of times people think, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. You know, um, this is okay, I'm, you know, I'm doing okay, I can tolerate this. But I want you to be thinking about these, uh, these red flags as I go through them and ask yourself if you're experiencing any of these red flags or if you know someone who could possibly be uh, experiencing any of these red flags. So, so somebody has little to no social interaction, either in person or otherwise, meaning over the phone or virtually. Though that's going to be someone who is probably, you know, after all these months of having little to no social interaction, that's going to really be a red flag because you're going to recognize that person as probably getting too much into their head and their thoughts and probably going to worst case scenario or feeling more helpless or hopeless. Individuals with a lack of purpose. You know, before all this, most of us had 
a lot of purpose. We had a lot of commitments, either social or otherwise. But when we lose all those commitments, our busy schedule goes from going, you know, 100 miles an hour to going five miles an hour or being stopped. And that really causes us to think, okay, well, why am I getting up? Why am I, you know, what is today worth, you know, what's the worth in getting up? What's the worth in eating and sleeping and reaching out? I can't do anything. So when somebody's really not having, you know, feeling a sense of purpose, then they decline quickly and they become at a higher risk. Change in sleep. So when someone has a change in sleep, we're seeing people that are either sleeping all day or staying in bed most of the day because again, there's not a lot a, a purpose for them. There's nowhere for them to go or anything significant for them to do. So they end up declining because they're sleeping a lot or you've got those individuals that their mind just worries and worries. What if, what if, what if, what if? They're watching the news too much and they're thinking, oh my God, oh my God. And so they can't sleep or their sleep is interrupted because their mind just won't shut down. Well, we cannot, our bodies need sleep to recuperate, to recover. And when we go so many days without that or without structured, you know, good strong periods of sleep, then our health and our mind gets compromised and our ability to think clearly uh, becomes compromised. Change in appetite. So when you see individuals who are uh, eating more uh, because there's nothing else to do, so I might as well eat. I might as well eat um, the things I probably shouldn't be eating, but okay, well, what the heck? Um, I need to because I, it makes me feel good because there's nothing else to do. Or you see individuals who've just stopped eating. Their, they, their routine is so um, messed up that they're not really getting up at a certain time and eating. They're, not, they're missing lunch or they're missing dinner. Uh, they're just snacking. Uh, they were used to being physically active or socially active. And so they would go to breakfast or lunch or dinner with individuals or would be so active that they would be hungry. So when you have this change of appetite and you're not really eating the right things or eating frequently, you're really messing up with the, the way your body functions and that puts you at a risk. Increase in sadness and or worry. Again, we see a lot more people uh, just finding that their baseline throughout the day is more of a ho-hum sadness, just a lack of um, interest in life or happiness about life. Or we see people that are just very wound up and um, scared and worried about not only getting out or what's going to happen when they can get out, but then they're watching the news and they're really worrying about uh, what they see in the news, you know, and, and that really is stressing people out. Increase in irritability. Again, some people you know, they're going through stages where sometimes they can tolerate all this and then sometimes they're like done and they become very um, less tolerant of other people, of situations. Um, when they do uh, interact with other people, they may be more harsh in their conversations and more straightforward and uh, not really filter themselves. Uh, and that may be because they're just... Um, frustrated about uh, being stuck, being uh, this feeling of loss of control of what they were used to doing their lives. Uh, poor self-care. If you are recognizing that you're not really uh, keeping up with your doctor's appointments, um, keeping up with your hygiene, those are pretty serious red flags. You know, not showering and brushing your teeth and washing up, keeping your home environment tidy, that, that those are pretty serious signs of kind of this lack of, this lack of interest in thriving. And we want to be aware of that. Uh, individuals who are having any thoughts of being, off being better off dead, that's a huge red flag. When people start thinking about, you know, well, what's the use you know, either I've lived a better, I've lived a good life and I'm done, 
or I just can't live this way anymore, um, not being able to see friends and family members, uh, then they really start to decline quickly. Our mind is very powerful. Our mind can control our body. And when we're telling our body, I'm done with you, you can shut down, then our body starts to respond. And that's not good. So I tell people, whenever you start having any kind of thoughts like that, that is not normal. That is a red flag to reach out to someone as soon as possible, be it a friend, a family member, a doctor, um, or just to call 911 and say, listen, I'm having these thoughts. You know, I, I don't know that I'll act in them, but that worries me. They can send uh, a mental health deputy out to kind of talk with you or help you, or they can get someone on the phone to kind of help you through that and figure out what to do. When somebody's having thoughts of ending their life, that's another huge red flag because that's, as soon as you have that thought, I tell people, just pick up the phone, dial 911, don't second, don't second guess yourself because that stops the process. That stops you from going down that rabbit hole of, well, how would I do it? You know, you need to kind of stop that immediately. And again, by making a call that stops the, the process or at least slows it down and they get you help immediately. Not that they're going to, you know, commit you or take you away. No, the goal is to help you figure out what's going on and what kind of help do you need. Okay. So social distancing does not mean social isolating. And I think a lot of us have been trying to uh, find a balance between that. We want to be safe, but yet we need to recognize that we thrive with social interaction. And so we need to think about that. So I want to talk about some self-care strategies. If you recognize that any of the things that I talked about before when I was talking about, you know, the self-assessment things, keep in mind that you, I, I want you to be looking at these self-care strategies and see what you can do to take care of yourself or your loved ones. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that later. So don't be afraid to leave home, but be safe about it. Uh, so many people really need some social interaction. And so I tell them, you know, go to the grocery store several times a week, uh, but wear your mask and be safe with what you touch. You know, if you need to go be outdoors, then go to like an outdoor park, like the BK Park is wonderful because you can walk around as little or as much as you want and people pass you by and you can say good morning. So you may not know the people, but it's at least it's somebody telling you and greeting you and recognizing you and saying, hey, good morning, how are you doing? And you can be, you know, definitely six feet apart and it's outdoors, so it's a little safer. And if you want to wear your mask, you can. But again, you can still greet other people as they pass you on the pathway. But it's important to leave your home routinely so that you keep up your skill set, your, um, your, your physical skills in getting ready, washing up, getting dressed, getting in your car, keep up your driving skills and going out so you keep some sense of some social skills too. Interconnectivity is crucial. Being a part of a, an organization, a group, uh, a family, a community is very important. So it, when at all possible, try to connect with other people, either by phone, um, in person, if you feel safe, uh, or virtually, try to really uh, find a way to connect to anyone else on a regular basis. They probably need it as much as you do. I tell people to limit your access to news. There's so many uh, negative uh, things on the news right now that can be very troublesome. If you can, you know, in the first 10 to 15 minutes of the news, you've got the crucial stuff. If you feel that need to um, 
be on top of things because you want to know what if something happens and some new news and I don't know about it. Uh, you need to know about that. But more than likely, after a certain amount of minutes, it's, it's not as crucial to you. So limit that. By all means, do not leave the TV running on the news because that can really um, increase your, your depression and your anxiety. And that, again, that compromises your immune system and your body. So keep that in mind. If you need, you need outside news or outside um, voices, then put it on um, you know, some music or put it on, I tell people, put it on the Food Channel, put it on um, the Hallmark Channel, something that is not, that's more positive than negative, that will lift your spirits more. Dr. Uh, Perez, yes. we, have, we have like one minute. So okay. I'm so sorry. Um, yes. I think it's really important for you to tell people how they can get in, get in contact with you. So if you wouldn't mind yes, telling them. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so here is my contact information. You can call me, text me, email me. And what I want to make sure everyone knows is that whether, if, if you're needing some help, please reach out to myself or anyone else. If I'm not a good match, I will help you find someone that is a good match for you. It's just important that you just reach out to anyone. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the time to reach out to you. Well, and I do think it's important that people realize that now they can get help um, online. You yes. know, they don't have to go into the office. So if you are really afraid of getting out, there are services that you can get help via phone uh, or via your computer. So, and I know you've been really instrumental in trying to get that word out to people. You know, if you're concerned, don't worry about it. We can come to you via phone and via your computer. So Norma's information uh, is right there. And Dr. Perez, we're so happy to have you here today. I'm so sorry we're having to uh, yeah. catch a, a little bit short, but I think uh, your message of looking for those um, looking for those things in your own life, but also looking for somebody that you love, a neighbor. If you start to see, you know, your neighbor coming out to get their mail at four o'clock in their robe, you know, several days in a row, it could be that they might need help too. And there's ways that you can help connect them. So we really want to help everybody if we can. Well, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Perez. And uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. When we come back, we're actually going to take about an eight minute break and then we'll uh, introduce or tell you about our raffle winners then. Uh, but a great time to go get another cup of coffee and we'll see you back in just a little bit.
So we're getting back. It is nine o'clock. I see our esteemed mayor is here. We're going to do a couple of raffles real quick, Sandy, if you don't mind. Uh, we have some very generous donors. And so the next raffle is our third raffle. And so um, our third raffle is from LT Senior Services. And it is for a $25 gift card to HEB. Who wouldn't want that, right? So our winner of that is Jim and Alice N. Jim and Alice N. So you have won that. Uh, the next is from Funeral Consumer Alliance. Let me see if I can find their slide real quick. We'll go and share it. And they have a really great book. Um, and you're going to get some brochures from them too. But the Funeral Alliance is looking for ways to reduce final expenses. That's their specialty. They are a nonprofit. And it's really fascinating what they do. They go through and they find out what the costs are for funerals all across the city. And then they have a brochure that they can give you to help you find out what the cost should be uh, for different methods um, at that time in your life. But they have a great book. It's called, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And our winner is Diane V, Diane V. So when you come get your lunch, uh, the raffle I, or the uh, door prizes will be there. Our next is a home modification. And let me stop this and I'll pull up the slide for the next person who is, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, it is... Let me see if you can see that. This is for um, Enabled Living, Home Safety and Accessibility Evaluations by Occupational Therapist, Agent and Place Specialist. And they have donated to us, it's um, worth about, it's over $300. And it is for a home modification evaluation. So they'll actually come into your home and they'll help you learn what you can do to modify your home so that you can stay in your home. And our winner of that is Barbara N. Barbara N. So congratulations, everybody. We are on to our next speaker, our Lakeway Mayor, Sandy Cox. Welcome. I've got a little bio. I'll just go ahead and read it here real quick. Sandy's the mayor for the city of Lakeway. She was elected in 2018. It seems like yesterday that you were it elected. It does. Yeah. <laughs> but, but then it doesn't because we had COVID. My goodness. Wow. <laughs> Uh, in short in amount of time, Sandy has rebuilt the pipeline of volunteers to better represent the current Lakeway demographics. She's also opened up and enhanced the communication with area residents, empowered committees, and commissions to be the voice of the community, and completed work that led to a revamp of the 20-year comprehensive plan. She believes deeply in giving back to the community through volunteerism and board service. She's an honor to serve. There's so many. Uh, you volunteered all over Skip the place. Yeah, okay, Skip there's like there's like 15 <laughs> of them. Um, the one, one very close to my heart was Lake Travis Education Foundation. I was president mm -hmm. of that organization, and that is an excellent group to participate in at any age. I would encourage any volunteer, if you want to be um, participating in that, it is a great group that helps our schools and helps our teachers, too. So she's been a resident of Lakeway for more than 20 years. She and her husband raised their daughter, Riley, in Lakeway and still reside in the same home that they built in 1999. She holds a bachelor's of science degree in both electric engineering and computer engineering from Georgia Tech prior to retiring from the technology industry in 2009. She successfully led worldwide technology businesses, operations, and supply chains for 21 years at Motorola. She's an empty nester. Jay and Sandy enjoys boating on Lake Travis, exploring the outdoors, and attending artistic events. We are so happy to have you here today. And I know our topic has probably changed 15 times as the landscape <laughs> of the world has changed, but we're so pleased mm -hmm. that you're going to be able to spend a little bit of time uh, with us to today to talk about the latest in Lakeway, including uh, COVID and other updates like that. So I'm going to go off camera and you can share your screen, I believe, but let me know if you have any problems. Um, we'll have questions that we might have and we'll take those at the end and I'll kind of throw those to you at the very end. Great. Thank you, Cindy. You're welcome. Yes. Well, I am so pleased uh, to be here. I unfortunately missed uh, this great seminar last week or last year um, because my mom went into surgery uh, unexpectedly and uh, our mayor pro tem, Lori Higginbotham, uh, stood in for me. I hear she did a fantastic job. So I'm hoping to live up to the, the same uh, performance that she gave last year. But, you know, we all know 2020 has been a humdinger of a year uh, with COVID-19. And, uh, and it's added a lot of stress uh, to all of us and, you know, stress to businesses, stress personally uh, and stress to the city. Uh, you know, we, 
We've had to do a lot of different things that we haven't done in the past. But what I want to rest assure all of you is that your council has been working very hard for you during this time. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly uh, humbled and appreciative of the amount of hours and thought that go into helping us shepherd our city forward. And uh, we've got seven great council members uh, that that give tirelessly of their time. And, and uh, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, we pay you the big bucks. And uh, for those that don't know that, um, we do this completely volunteer. There's no compensation uh, for this role. Uh, so when you hear that, most people are, are in jest uh, with that. And uh, I hear I got a raise this year, but uh, it was on zero. So anyway, with that, I thought I'd start off um, with not talking about COVID-19 for a change and start off with what have we been doing this year and how did we start the year? And, you know, we started off the year uh, finalizing our transportation plan. And if y'all remember, you know, like Cindy said, in 2018, I was elected and one of the, you know, top, top priorities that I've had was really putting plans in place to really drive our future. And that has been near and dear to my heart because with the explosive growth, the change in demographics, uh, you know, it's very, very easy for us to lose our culture and lose what we love about Lakeway and why we all moved here. Um, and so really wanting to protect that. And so and so that's why you see a lot of different plans coming out uh, from the, the city because this is us trying to move to a driving position, not a reacting position. And so talking about driving, we started off the year finalizing the transportation plan. And we had worked with an engineering firm as well as the transportation steering committee, uh, which was a committee of volunteers that uh, helped us look at the engineering results uh, from doing a comprehensive study of Lakeway, not just one road, we looked at all roads and, um, and took, the, took the engineering data, looked at the cost, took the, the feedback, uh, from the community and put some recommendations forward uh, uh, to the council. And at the time we were considering whether we went for a transportation bond in May. I'm so thankful that we didn't um, because that would have been an incredibly challenging time uh, you know, with the elections and so forth when we were in the midst of COVID-19. But um, we're now memorializing uh, those recommendations and putting it into a thoroughfare plan. And you know, people have asked me why, why is a thoroughfare plan important? And it is a document that we could point to in the city when a developer comes to us and says, I wanna build here. We can very quickly point and say, and by the way, we need a four lane divided road here. Um, and, and know that it's important for the transportation network and not just rely on a developer's data on the, the transportation uh, studies that they do. This is one that looks at our entire grid. And so at, at city council this week, we looked at the first draft of the thoroughfare plan and, uh, and we'll have another reading of it in October when we have our regular meeting. And uh, I hope you know by the end of the year that we finalize it because again, it's a really important document for us to have. Um, it can really help us drive a change. It helps us uh, work with our partners in Campo and TxDOT. So when, you know, they're looking at projects and so forth, we can, we could say, you know, what we need. And, um, you know, a great example is the 620 whitening project. Uh, after that project is done, and, and maybe I should dispel um, some misinformation that's out there, the 620 whitening project is still moving forward. It's just not funded to build it right now. And that's what happened uh, earlier this year when uh, Governor Abbott uh, gave over $400 million to uh, the Central Texas region to fix 35. But there had to be a match and they had to find, uh, uh, sorry, 4.2 billion, I said 400 million, 4.2 billion. And uh, Travis County had to find, and Campo had to find, you know, 600 million dollars. And unfortunately, you know, when you have a large project like 620, which is going to be somewhere in the 80 million-ish dollars, um, it was a really easy target uh, to start to make that 60 million or 600 million. So so the funding has, it has gone away to execute it, but the engineering has not stopped. 
it's continuing that they're moving into what they call their PS and E phase now, uh, where they're going to get into much more detailed engineering. They have a very rough um, uh, idea right now, and uh, they're working with all the property owners around 620. And so, you know, we expect that the engineering will finalize in about a year and a half. So, you know, we have time to find funding and the goal is to have the project shovel ready so that when the money is available uh, that we can get started. So, so 620 widening is, is important to us and we all know that, that we have definite um, traffic congestion issues, although with COVID-19 it's, it's lightened up a little bit because people are working from home. But nonetheless, it's still there, and, and we've, we've probably pushed out some of the, the issues a little bit, but they're not going to be gone. But one of the key pieces that we do have in this thoroughfare plan is what's next. And the last thing that I think any of us want to see is an elevated road uh, over 620 and over Lakeway. I think it would forever change uh, the landscape of Lakeway. We would look like 183. We would hear traffic noise no matter where we were. And um, and so in this thoroughfare plan, we're writing things like that in, that it needs to be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, it's not gonna look like a highway. It's gonna look like you're coming into a town. You're gonna have landscape medians. Um, we're gonna use um, uh, you know all of our, our work to make sure that we find you either go under or you go around Lakeway. Um, you don't go over Lakeway. And, and so that's why this document's really important and we're working on it. So, so that really kind of started off this year was transportation. Uh, we very quickly after the transportation study finalized the comprehensive plan and so excited about this plan because it took 18 months. We kicked it off just a few months after I took office in 2018. We had a great uh, group of volunteers. Uh, honestly, we could not have hired better people um, <clears throat> to make out the representation from the community. Um, and they gave tire tirelessly of their time to help us put this together. They, they, they went out into the community and talked to people and really um, understood you know, what this community wanted. And we utilized a consultant to help us put the whole program together. Uh, doing a comprehensive plan is a 20 year plan and it's a pretty uh, large undertaking. And so we utilize a, comp uh, a consultant to help us structure it and, um, and, and pull it together and help us write it. Uh, but our volunteers were key in the content of when it, what went in there. And so after the 18 months, we did finish it in March of this year. And, and that's step one of planning, right? So you have to have your vision and that's what the comprehensive plan is. And then uh, there was several key chapters that were in that comprehensive plan that springboard strategies that come off of the comprehensive plan. And so that's what we've been working on next. And obviously a transportation plan is one of the key strategies uh, that was enumerated in that in that plan. But you know, not not so soon after we finalized the comprehensive plan, we finalized the trail connectivity plan. And that was the Parks and Rec uh, committee that worked uh, and mapped with the Parks and Rec staff uh, all of the trails in our area and finding where we have breaks. So, you know, the goal being is that we can connect all the trails between our parks and sidewalks and um, and then also shared use paths um, so that we, we create the mobility that's safe in our community. Uh, anyone that, that goes down 620, you know it's a very dangerous place uh, to be for a biker. Uh, there are too many turns left and right. Um, and even when the widening project happens and some shared use paths go in, those are still not gonna be as safe as maybe taking a parallel path uh, to 620 where you're able to go for you know, a mile without a turn or an interaction with a car. So we're working on, on, on that network and that plan was finalized, I believe in April. And again, it was to a lot of great work uh, by the staff and volunteers uh, that put that together. and. You know, one of, the, one of the things that came out in the comprehensive plan that is probably no shock to anyone is that our parks are really important to us. And, uh, and you know, we want to keep it that way. We want to keep them, uh, you know, clean. We want to progress them in time, you know, reimagine them. And so we also kicked off a master park plan 
Uh, we hadn't done this in many years, and uh, and so we're we're looking at you know what what do we have in our inventory? What do we need? What do we think we need for the future? And uh, again, putting those plans in place. Um, and I expect uh, we were supposed to see it in October, but COVID nineteen slowed us down just a little bit. So I think we'll see it in December, uh, the first draft of what our master park plan looks like. And again, this helps us identify what we need over time. And I keep talking about all these plans and strategies, but once you finalize the plans and strategies, then you add the finances to it. And I, that is literally the most important part of this exercise at the end, because you can have all these wants and you can have all these needs, um, but the last thing you want to do is to skyrocket taxes, um, sp you know, not plan for a spend that's coming in years. And so once we finish a lot of these major strategies, uh, like facility needs assessments and things like that, we will utilize all that information to go into a capital improvement plan uh, that will that'll identify the sources of funding. Uh, sometimes it's going to be taxes. Uh, so something that, you know, we'll, we'll fund out of our capital fund. Um, sometimes it's going to be something that is large enough that would require a bond, like most transportation things are. Uh, anyone that's lived here for a while, I think you probably remember the Flint Rock Road bond that we did many years ago. Uh, but, you know, so, so it may be a bond, it may be a grant, uh, or it may be uh, joint funding with another entity like Travis County or Campo or TxDOT. And so and so you take all of this and you look out in time and figure out where you have issues. You might plan to put some money aside sooner so that you don't have a big bubble later. So, th so that's a really key piece. You take that vision, put the strategy, you put the financial plan underneath it, and then the staff has all their goals that runs right off of that. And that's how you drive. Uh, so, so we're getting close to that point uh, where we'll start that financial plan. Um, but you know, there's many, many layers of planning that has to go into uh, this whole process in order to to make sure that we comprehend everything that we need to do. Uh, you know, people have said, well, we, you know, we've had to use some consultants. Well, we we do when you don't have the staff capability. Um, we have a pretty lean and mean staff. Uh, and anyone that's been, uh, you know, around the, the city and been volunteering, you know how much we rely on, on volunteers uh, because we have one deep in many of the uh, different functions in the city. And, and so it's really hard to put big projects on any of the staff. And when you haven't planned, you don't actually know how to structure a strategy and so forth like that. So, so anyway, we've been utilizing that help so that we, have really good solid plans put together um, that we can drive for, for many, many years. Um, so I'm gonna kind of turn and talk taxes for a moment. Uh, so I have to tell you, I was elected to council in 2014, served for two terms, uh, and then I've been elected as mayor in 2018, and I've done five budget cycles uh, with the city. This by far has been one of the most difficult cycles we've ever had. Um, the Just because of the variability, uh, we start the budget process in May of every year. And so if we all remember back in May, uh, we were still closed down in a lot of places and uh, we're starting to open up at that time. Uh, the city had not seen the results of the sales tax uh, hit uh, based on the closures for all the businesses uh, through the end of March and April and in the part of May until late in May. And that was only for March because it's, it's you know, two months in the rears. And, and so really did not understand how uh, the sales tax and the effect of COVID um, were going to affect the budget. And um, it is highly variable, um, but once we've gotten through, you know, August, which then you can see the June numbers, which was, you know, a full open month. Um, you know, we've been pretty resilient um, in in the city with our sales tax. Uh, we we obviously, like everyone else, had um, significant hits in, in April and May. 
Um, but but we actually did better than we were forecasting, did better than um, what we were hearing from other cities. Uh, so that's really good news. Uh, I will tell you our grocers uh, and our liquor receipts uh, were definitely some of the hallmarks of, of why things uh, went so well. So very, very appreciative of Randall's and HEB. Um, the, those two uh, companies uh, just worked tirelessly. Uh, and if y'all remember, it, their stores emptied twice um, during this time. And uh, I've never worked, seen people work so hard in my life, uh, just trying to keep keep food on the shelves. And so, you know, we've been very fortunate with, with the people and the businesses in our area. Um, but, you know, we've had a, a number of businesses that have been hit horribly. And, uh, and, and so I also think the other piece of this is that uh, a lot more of our residents stayed local and ate local and shop local. Uh, and I'm very thankful for all of you that have done that. Uh, it is, it has been that piece that is, is keeping these businesses running. Um, and, uh, it, and so whether it was takeout service, uh, you know, the extra tips and so forth, the liquor to go, whatever it's been that you've been doing, um, thank you, because, uh, you know, a number of businesses are, are hanging on because of, of our support. But because, of, you know, again, going back to the budget, a lot of variability. Uh, so not only variability in sales tax, there's variability at the swim center. Uh, you know, we sell memberships. And if your pool's not open, you're not selling memberships. Uh, same thing with the activity center. You know, there's variability there. We've had fines and fees, which uh, literally the the largest drop that we have in our budget is the fines and fees, which come from the police department and the court mainly, uh, but also there's uh, some fines and fees that come from building de development services. So when maybe you receive a notice of violation for something, um, you didn't pull your trash cans in or something like that, um, you would you could end up having a fee with that. But again, majority of it is, is with, um, tickets uh, that the police write and any court fines and fees that come through there. Um, and so that's actually, uh, believe it or not, uh, over $200,000 down uh, from last year. So it, it, that was actually probably the headline to write home about was, uh, you know, that drop was pretty significant. So we saw a lot of revenue drop, um, you know, between those line items and then uh, a nice unique um, issue happened with the appraisal court. The appraisals uh, are down this year compared to last year. So for those that have been involved with taxes in the, in the past, we have rates called the effective rate. Well, that is the rate that if you don't fund any more dollars into the city, that's the rate that is the same as last year. And it went up. Uh, we have not seen that in the last decade. Uh, back when the financial crisis happened in 2008 timeframe, uh, we saw the appraisals change in that way, um, but we haven't seen it in the last decade. So in order to keep the tax dollars going to the city flat, the tax rate had to go up uh, from last year. So last year was 1645. And to keep it flat, it was 1653 this year. Um, so, so those, so if you've been hearing some of these numbers, that's what's been going on and what we've been trying to deal with. So, fast forward to this Monday, the city council decided to keep the tax rate flat at 1645. And what that means is there will be less taxes going to the city uh, because it is lower than the effective rate, which is now called the no new revenue rate, because that would have been 1653. We decided to go with 1645 so that anyone that had the same value on their home, appraisal value on their home this year, um, you would not pay more taxes uh, to the city. And I want to be careful with that because I'm talking about the city. We have no jurisdiction over the school district, we have no jurisdiction over the fire department, the water department. This is just a city and we're only 7% of your taxes roughly. So um, so that sliver, uh, we did not end up raising taxes. And so I'm actually proud to say 
uh, on the three budgets that I have done as your mayor, uh, the rate has been 1645. So for, for three years, uh, it's been a flat tax rate. Now, Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down and what that means, but but um, we have finalized that. And I really want to give some kudos to our city manager, Julie Oakley, and the team, because uh, this was one of the roughest uh, budget cycles for them. Uh, the council was looking for different ways to cut. We were asking a lot of questions, as we always do. Um, you know, we're, we're a council that that really probes and, and looks what's behind the data and tries to solve problems. And, and so uh, a lot of work on the staff uh, and again, during COVID-19, uh, but I, I'm really happy with where we ended up. Um, we also, uh, one of my biggest things that I was worried about was, you know, it's very tough with a, with a government entity. Once you set your taxes, that's it for the year. We don't know what's gonna happen next year. And so I want to make sure that our fund balance is robust enough so that if we have any curveballs thrown next year with COVID-19, that we have enough funds to help us uh, from a cash flow perspective. And, uh, and so we did protect that. Um, we're going to be, after the end of this coming year, at a 34% uh, fund balance, which is perfect in my mind. Uh, we we reset the expectations on the fund balance when I came into office in 2018. Originally, we were targeting a 25% fund balance, and we moved it to 30 with a high end of 35, um, just to give us a little bit more buffer for that rainy day and, and look at it. The rainy day is here. So, um, so I am very, very um, comfortable now with where we've ended up, uh, a lot of learning along the way. Um, but uh, I'm, I will have to say I'm very glad the budget season is over. Um, yeah, you can't imagine the amount of time uh, that goes into the budgeting. Um, I do want to, you know, while we're talking about money, uh, one of the committees we kicked off uh, in, I think it was the June time frame, was the Economic Development Committee. And again, this is one of the committees coming off of the comprehensive plan. and. It's so important right now. Um, you know, how do we how do we help the economic recovery of our businesses uh, in the city of Lakeway right now? How do we plan for the future? How do we attract um, the businesses that are going to serve us? Because in the end, the city of Lakeway is a resort style community, and we um, love our parks, we love our golf, we love the lake, and and so how do we make sure that as 620 redevelops, uh, as the last pieces of land develop, that we're developing it, developing it consistent with what we need in the future, that we have enough sales tax generation to pay for the new roads, that we have uh, enough diversity so that we're resilient in times like these. And by God, at some point in time, we need a full service breakfast place uh, for brunch uh, on Sunday for me. Uh, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that, I, you know, I love my brunch, but but they're going to be reporting out in October uh, some of their findings and uh, and talked about our next steps on what we should do. And uh, so, so stay tuned for that. It's a, an important part of our financial structure and how do we utilize different means and funds so that we don't have to grow tax rate over time. Um, I don't. I don't want us when we build out and and all these new roads are there that we have to take care of. And now we have a much larger expense that uh, that we have to continue increasing taxes to, to maintain. Um, we want to make sure that we've got lots of funding sources and we have hotel tax that we can utilize and and so forth. And so um, so I'm going to stop on taxes. Uh, let's go to COVID-19 for a moment. Uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> Uh, you know, I, my heart goes out to everyone. Uh, this has been an incredibly challenging time for people. And there isn't anyone that isn't affected by this in one way, shape or form. Uh, whether you know someone or you've been laid off, uh, whether maybe pay has been reduced, uh, you know, a loss of a loved one, someone being sick. 
uh, just the sheer isolation. Uh, you know, it, we're not meant to be isolated uh, as a, as a species here, and and to all have to stay at home, and especially those of you that are on this aging well uh, seminar, uh, you're in that demographic that we're really trying to protect. Uh, the numbers show the highest death occurrence uh, in that 65 and older bracket. And um, and so, you know, if, if anyone's been in a nursing home, assisted living and so forth, uh, I know it has to be challenging and difficult and the anxiety's high, the depression's high. And, you know, I think um, one of the best things that that we do as a community is taking care of each other. And uh, I, I'm really proud of Lake Travis One, uh, and that was a group of our churches that came together to really try to help um, with the outreach and for, to help anyone in need. You know, whether you need a computer help, you need someone to go grocery shopping for you, um, maybe you just needed someone um, to talk to, uh, whatever it was, um, they filled the gap. And, and Lake Travis Crisis Ministries uh, has. Uh, you know, doubled and sometimes tripled uh, the amount of food and rental assistance and so forth they've given to our community. And and this is one of the things I love about Lakeway. Uh, we, you know, you, you have a need, the need gets filled. Uh, we have so many great, um, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations, you know, like uh, Drive a Senior and, uh, you know, I just could like name a lot of them. And but <clears throat> we have so many. Uh, that are willing to help. And, and so I'm thankful for everyone chipping in during this hard time because, you know, a lot of our residents have, have fared uh, better than we would expect. Um, and it's just because of the care that this community takes of each other. Um, we, uh, like, you know, Travis County saw a very large spike in the May, June timeframe. Uh, and, you know, really it's a tribute to Memorial Day and graduations and things like that. And and so although wearing a mask, uh, it can be challenging for some, if you don't have a medical condition, it is still the number one defense uh, for COVID-19. And we talk about the hygiene, washing hands regularly, don't touch your face, um, and then to keep that social distance a six feet. And and if we keep practicing this, we're gonna we're gonna learn how to live with COVID. 19. We're going to keep trying to do things a little differently. And um, and so we just <clears throat> we may not be able to go back to what we have always done uh, in the past before, you know, March of this year. But we're going to figure out how to get back to what we we love and enjoy. And, and we are doing that. Uh, there is still an order from the governor and the judge uh, on the books that we cannot gather greater than 10 people. And that'll that extends until December 15th. Uh, and there's been a lot of messaging that just went out in this last week about thinking about doing Thanksgiving a little differently and, uh, you know, thinking about virtual Thanksgivings and keeping it to your household and, and things like that. And and really, it's, it's all of us trying to be safe and not to create a spike. Uh, of all the numbers I look at, you know, we could look at the number of cases in the city like where we're um, – and in the Lake Travis area, we're over 600 cases uh, since March. We have probably about 70 active now, which is which grew um, from last week. We were in that 35-ish uh, range for a couple weeks, and now we doubled uh, over the last week. Um, and I would tell you, you know, what it, what has changed? Um, we had Labor Day. We, the schools have gone back to um, in-person classes. We've had football games, right? So we're getting back out and we're interacting. Um, and and so what we have to watch is is that change, but more importantly, we have to watch the hospitalization number. And as of right now, that is pretty much flat. So, you know, knocking on, knocking on wood, it stays there. And uh, we don't see a spike coming through uh, you know, this this fall, you know, obviously a lot of people are concerned with flu season and COVID-19. You know, I am not a doctor, um, but my engineering mind says, I got to think that all the things that we're doing 
to stop the spread of COVID-19 is going to help stop the spread of the flu. Um, washing the hands, wearing the mask, right? Um, I think if we continue to practice that, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that our flu season is better than we've seen it. Um, but, you know, only time will tell. Uh, the flu shots are out. And uh, if your doctor tells you to go get a flu shot, go get a flu shot. Um, because that'll be, you know, one of your great lines of defense um, uh, during this season. And so um, I'll probably let me um, I'm sure some people are going to have questions on this. So I'm going to I'm going to skip on and talk about my last topic, which is uh, our propositions on the ballot uh, for November. And I probably most of you have been here for a while in our community and know that Back in, you know, 2018, there was a charter issue that was found during the early voting uh, time. And uh, I, I, of course, I can't forget it because I was running for mayor at the time. I thought I was running for a three-year term. And with two weeks to go, found out that that term was going to be one year. And it was because our constitution, Texas constitution and our charter in Lakeway were in conflict with one another. And unfortunately in 2014, when the election system changed to a three-year term, it did not match with the election system that is required by the state of Texas. And so when you go to three-year terms, it requires you to run a majority system, which is you have to have 50% of the vote plus one. We run a plurality, which is just mo most votes. It also requires um, that you put in a place system and then have runoffs um, for those places. And, and so that was the miss in the charter. So what happened in 2018 is we rolled back to our old election system. So for two decades or more, we have run a two-term plurality system. And, um, and so we, we rolled back to that have been running all of our elections off of that system uh, since 2018. And now we're at the first point that we can change our charter. So um, our Lakewood City Charter requires every four years that we review the charter and make any changes uh, that we see fit. Um, however, we have the ability every two years uh, based on uh, the Texas legislature, that we can make changes uh, to the charter. And so literally this election in November is the soonest that we could bring forward uh, any changes to um, our charter to really um, bring it in line legally with the Texas Constitution. So we kicked off the Charter Review Committee uh, earlier this year. Um, every council member had a member that we put on that committee to look at it. And majority of the propositions that are on the ballot are to fix inconsistencies with our charter and the Texas Constitution. And then the other ones that are on uh, the ballot were things that were necessary. And I'll just give you an example of, of one, which is the uh, we're, we are proposing to remove the, tr the volunteer treasurer position. And that has been in the charter um, since since its existence. And that was back when we didn't have a finance department. And now we do. So there really isn't a need for that role anymore. It's, it's redundant to um, to uh, the finance department that we have. And so so those are the types of things that are in there. Um, and so I would really encourage you all. There's a great document on the city website that will walk you through every one of the propositions. And it's written in, in a plain manner that you can read the ballot language. You can then see an explanation so you understand what it's doing. And um, and you can get through all of it very simply. It's it's about three pages. And like I said, it's out on the um, out on the website, but I would Really encourage, I think probably everyone on this uh, webinar is registered to vote, but if you're not, uh, October 5th is fast approaching. So please, please get registered. 
And um, and we will be in early elections in about two weeks uh, so uh, or early voting. So I encourage you to vote early. It is um, we we're not sure the volume that is going to come through on Election Day uh, because COVID-19 uh, could change a lot of how people vote. A number of people really believe in the traditional vote on Election Day, but a uh, number are really worried about pot potentially uh, spreading COVID-19. So that may change the, even the early voting uh, patterns that we've seen. Um, but uh, but I would encourage you to get um, uh, versed in, in what is what we are proposing uh, from the council. It was a unanimous uh, decision uh, for the seven items that are on there from from council, and we took a lot of consideration uh, into what um, uh, and what what we were really looking uh, for, and trying to make sure that we just put the important stuff on. The ballot, knowing that this is a November presidential election, and people are going to get weary by the time they get to the end of the ballot. So, so I've been talking for quite a while. I'm going to uh, pause now and see if we have any questions um, from the group. Hey, Sandy, I've got a couple questions for you here, and then we'll monitor the question and answer area too. Well, first thing is excellent on tax um, tax rate and no increase. That's just a huge benefit and um, I know as a homeowner I really appreciate that. So explain to me a little bit are you saying that our property values did not go up? I didn't quite understand how. Yeah. That... Okay. Yeah so uh, the legislature last uh, time around uh, there was a lobbying group for the realtors and they did not want to share the values of the houses when they sold and that was how the appraisal district was was monitoring what the market was doing. And so they've actually had to rebuild how they're going to appraise houses in the future. And so this year they just left them flat from last year. Unless you like if you put in a pool, then your, your value went up. Right. But if you if you did nothing to your home, your values for the most part. Right. This is all for the most part, because every house has a different uh, different, uh, you know, set of rules and guidelines, right? But for the most part, um, they stayed flat. So so that's, you know, really good news for, for all of us uh, that, uh, you know, no, no more taxes, uh, at least from the city of Lakeway this year. But again, I got to be careful because I'm sure there's one person that their appraisal went up because right. uh, it's so, all on averages. This is so interesting because I'm a realtor. So um, we are a non-disclosure state. And so uh, the information for our sales is not shared. And what happened in, um, I don't really want to get into it, but our information was being sold uh, to the tax taxing authorities. So it was really, um, it was really kind of a bad deal because we are a non-disclosure mm -hmm. state and that's the way Texas is. So for years, our sales, uh, sales figures were not recorded. So, and that's just the state of Texas. Of course, our tax rate is very high. Property tax rate is very high. So anybody who comes from out of state, they're just in shock at high, how high the tax rate is because it could be 1% or, or lower than that in other states. Of course, we don't have state tax. You know, yeah. So when you're buying your food, it says, is that right? No, at, at the end of the year, you don't have to pay state tax. Right. You know? So, But, but, um, I, but yeah. you know, Cindy, what's interesting is the city of Lakeway, uh -huh. is in the bottom 6% of cities in the state of Texas taxing. Well, the other thing is our school still is allowing uh, for the discount for the school tax too. And I think we're one of the last mm -hmm. districts to be doing that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, kudos to Lakeway because I'm saying that's way worse than other communities. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. again, we have so many people relocating from other cities. And when they say our, our property tax rate, they about sure. go through the roof. But the thing is, you have to look at if you're working, then you're not paying state tax um, throughout the year. So just kind of interesting yeah. um, how the perspective is. But we've been a non-disclosure state for years. So the, mm -hmm. the data of your sales has not been recorded. But they found a, a way in through the back door, which was uh, mm -hmm. not really very cool. So now, interesting. Now, spoiler alert, 
your yes. your tax your appraisals are going up next year. Yeah, um, well, as you would expect, because <laughs> right now we're in a booming real estate market. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough homes on the market. We're multiple offers, people going tens of thousands over uh, what the house is actually listed for. So it's crazy. It's just a really crazy time. I uh, had a question for you about the median on 620. So sure. I'm going through physical therapy right now with Lakeway Aquatic. So I forget to turn, you know, I live uh, over on Palos Verdes. So I forget to turn to go in the back way you know, to go through Wells Fargo. So I go up 620 and I want to turn to go into Lakeway Aquatic and those darn medians are there. So what do mm -hmm. I do? I go up to Bella Montagna and I do a little U-turn and I see all their curbs are like falling apart and they're, they've been hit, I'm sure, by a trillion different tractors mm -hmm. and trailers and things like that. So, uh, and other people are just doing U-turns right there as soon as mm -hmm. the medians stop. So what's a solution? Is that going to continue up? Um, why did it stop there? Uh, what are some safety things uh, that we can tell our citizens about? Mm -hmm. Well, and um, it's a great question. Uh, so the so the meetings that went in, um, this is something that the council has talked about uh, multiple times over the last year and a half, and the cuts are exactly mirrored to what the 620 widening project is going to look like. Okay. So, so, you know, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that we didn't end up putting cuts somewhere else, training people that those are the turns and then come right back a couple of years later and then have different cuts. So, so it mirrors the plan for 620 widening. Um, the, the area where they're at, which is pretty much Lomans to Lakeway Boulevard, right, is that piece of Lakeway. Um, there's a hot spot analysis of a number of wrecks over the years. And it's because there's so much crisscross traffic, so many curb cuts that we wanted to get the advantage um, of improving the safety. Uh, and, and so that's um, really important why we wanted to get it in sooner. And, and the nice thing is, is tech stop paid for this entire program. Um, but the other piece for me is that it's been a great opportunity for us to get feedback now before we do a really expensive widening project about where we're having troubles. And, and so actually we've been feeding back the information we're hearing from businesses and citizens to TxDOT. And uh, I don't have an exact plan on this yet, but one of the things that has been realized through it is uh, there needs to be uh, a left turn cut right there in front of uh, that firehouse subs. And so TxDOT has analyzed it. Uh, they believe it's a good place to put it. And so they're putting plans in place to, to put that cut um, in there. So, uh, so, you know, if you have feedback, please get it into us. Um, we're feeding that into, uh, into TxDOT and they're analyzing some of the things that have been fed in um, aren't, we aren't able to do um, because of engineering reasons. Um, and they have, they have, you know, limited distances and so forth that they factor in with where you can have cuts. And, uh, and so, um, but I would, I'd love to hear the feedback um, and where we have troubles. Let's, let's like work through it now, because if we work through it now, then we get it fed into the 620 widening project. And so that, that really big project, when it happens, we get it right. So, I think this uh, is a message that you need to get out uh, to the community somehow or another because you have a lot of frustrated businesses and a lot of um, you know citizens too. But telling it that way makes me feel like okay, you want our feedback. You know, you want to oh, know. Yeah. yeah. Oh and yeah. So how would they? Who would they send an email to? Who would be a good person? We have we have a info line. Uh, it's info at lakeway txgovernor Okay. And at and, and any time you can send, whether it's, it's you know, if you've got some issues with um, the, you know, the medians or you've got some other issue or, hey, you want to say, you know, we love our city council, you know, we'll, we'll take that too. Um, we do love our city council. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean in, in all seriousness, it's a great way to, to send information in. You can send emails to the council um, and we read them. We, we read them. Uh, I, I will tell you, I honestly get so much email. I can't respond to everything, but I read everything. Um, but, uh, you know, we're also working with the chamber uh, and receiving the feedback from the businesses on um, 
on on the challenges with this, and you know we're we're working with TechSot. So, um, no, nothing's ever done. You know, we keep evolving, we keep making it better. Um, we're not going to be perfect on everything we do, um, and we got to learn learn through all of this um, what works and what's not working. But in the end, uh, you know, it will be you know safer in the in the heart of Lakeway because uh, I mean I, I've said it before. If you're at that post office or you're at Chicken Express and right before and all that crisscross traffic, if you didn't, if you haven't seen an accident there, you have seen an almost accident um, a number of times. And uh, and so now it's, it's going to be safer in, in that corridor. And then, yes, it's challenging with doing some of the U-turning. Um, you know, speaking of roads and all, we talked uh, at city council this week about Main Street. So when we did our transportation study, one of the most important roads uh, to be cut through in Lakeway is Main Street. And that street is supposed to go from, eight, you know, the back of H-E-B all the way to the Hills entrance. Yes. Right. So we'll be able to cut, connect Lomans Crossing um, with that whole area. And, you know, we as a city council are trying to make sure that we have a plan to get all of this grid connected so that, when the 620 widening happens, we don't have to get out on 620. We're going to be able to get majority of, we, of what we want to get done, done. And uh, through all of our back roads. Uh, unfortunately, the problem we're running into with Main Street is that in 2014, when we uh, had the PUD agreement with the Oaks and Stratus, um, when that, agree that PUD agreement was approved, it was supposed to be approved with a Main Street agreement. And unfortunately, it didn't happen. And so, so there's nothing in that PUD ordinance that, or a separate agreement that says when that road is going to get built or not. And so, what the city council has been working uh, with Stratus, you know, over this last year and some, uh, trying to get them to the table to work out a, an arrangement. We've actually written a Main Street agreement and given it to them. Um, they don't want to even entertain it. So what the council decided on Monday is that we're going to ask our zoning and planning committee commission to change the PUD ordinance because we can do that and put a commencement date and a completion date of that road in the ordinance. So that will give us some teeth to be able to drive that road um, and, and get that built. The Stratus is on the hook to build that road. It's going to be about a two and a half million dollar road. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an expensive road, which is why I think they continue to delay. And uh, because there's a very expensive bridge that they're going to have to build. So so that's one piece of it. There's one more piece that has to get built, and that is on the Lakeway Mud property, which Legends is is going to be commencing uh, their plans. And and we did all that work. Uh, a year ago with them to to set their zoning in that area and to um, to kind of move forward with that. So they are uh, going to start construction uh, in 2021. So we're going to have the east done. We'll have a, we have a plan on the west, uh, almost formalized, and then we have the center that we don't have the plan yet. And we're working uh, to do that. We've, we're having to play some more hardball than we wanted to. We were hoping that we would have a partner at the table and we don't. Um, we put an affidavit of non-compliance on the status property uh, so that if anyone were to uh, purchase that property, uh, that they would know that it's not in compliance with, with our ordinances. And so, so unfortunately, um, you know, it's it's been more difficult than we wanted. Uh, but but unfortunately, there's a number of deficiencies in that Oaks PUD ordinance, and um, so we've been working to get those deficiencies rectified. Um, and even since you know we we started that project, uh, Strata has sold uh, the front half that's been built uh, to TA Realty. So now we have TA Realty that we're working with as well, you know, to deal with it. So. Uh, so, you know, although you can't see the work that we're doing, uh, you know, we have a number of executive sessions that if you want to go back and take a look at our agendas, uh, those are there because we're having consultations with an attorney. And uh, it's not ready, you know, when you're writing a Main Street agreement, 
that's you don't want to put your your strategy out or your negotiation out in the public. And that's why you have that attorney client privilege to to work through that as a governing body. And then, you know, when you get to a point that you may work through an approval, you bring that out. And and so that the public does know what you're doing. And so you, you all saw if you if you read, uh, watch the Monday meeting, you know, you saw kind of some of the things that we've been doing with with the Oaks Pud. Well, we thank you so much. Um, it's been great to have you to get an update on all those different topics. I had no idea you'd be able to talk and fill all that in in your time. And we're so appreciative of you coming today. And uh, people, if we have more, let's see, exactly how do we find information on the propositions on the city website? Where do you go to? Hold on. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to give you. Hello. And guys, uh, great many questions. Yeah, very, very uh, interesting, Sandy. I'm sure you've learned more about things that you never thought that you'd have to learn about as your term as mayor. And one being doing Zoom meetings, which I've watched many of your uh, meetings and appreciate you guys uh, being able Thank to you. pivot and be able to do that. We are getting to our break time. So she's going to go ahead and post that in the chat. We'll see everybody back at the top of the hour. Uh, you got, ooh, not very long, about four minutes. So Ren, oh, go get a cup of coffee. No, it was great information. We're really appreciative. Thank you so much. And uh, we hope to have you next year live. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Everyone take care. Okay, we're going to go for a break, guys.
Okay, we're coming back in. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing one of my uh, screens and hopefully what I'm going to be sharing is the photo of the Lake Travis library. Let's see if that comes up. I'm going to look for Natalie to confirm with me that she could see that. Um, does everybody see yes. the Lake Travis library? Okay, excellent. So um, let's see. Uh, our winner number 10, raffle number 10, I'm a little bit out of order again, is a number, uh, is number 10, it's a book bag and it's from Lake Travis Community Library. The value is about $100 and Connie P won, Connie P. And for the uh, door prize winners, we'll reach out to you too and we'll let you know um, if it was you because there could be people with, you know, same last names or whatever, same names, initials. I um, also wanted to tell you about another book bag and this one is from... Turnkey Transitions and Turkey Transitions. Natalie, if you don't see it, let me know that. Um, but Turnkey Transitions is a move management service for seniors. They're full service relocation and resource, and they are one trusted resource to handle it all. It's actually an ancillary business that my real estate company has. It's called Turnkey Transition. So uh, they are donating a book bag, and the books are books about how to care for aging parents, moving your aging parents, and other books along those lines. So that is our raffle winner, and that is Jay Price. Uh, Jay Price, you won that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that. And I have, I see our speaker here. Hey, we're almost to you. Welcome, welcome. We're just doing some housekeeping. Um, it's Cindy. Hey there. <laughs> nice to see you, uh, doctor. Um, we're just doing a couple more raffles just real quickly. Uh, we have a bottle of wine. It's raffle number number seven. It is from First Light Home Care. We already showed their screen. Thank you so much, Bobby Scruggs, for giving us some alcohol. I heard alcohol sales have never been better, um, which you can imagine during COVID. It's like eating food. I had a friend who said, I've gained the COVID-15. I wondered why she didn't say COVID-19 um, because it's kind of like when you go to college, right? Doesn't, don't all the kids gain about 20 pounds? Um, so we are through our raffles for now. We have our next speaker. I'm going to call you Dr. Katie because I have no idea how to say your last name, but you can tell us how to say your last name. But I bet a, a lot of people say that, right? They're probably confused about how to say it. Um, but she uh, gets, she really gets to enjoy knowing her patients. She takes time to educate them on particular disease processes. She helps them achieve their health goals, her passion for infectious disease and public help means she's always looking to help for community heal. In her free time, she likes rowing, working out, hiking, reading, cooking, and traveling. She enjoys new places and spending time with her family and friends. She went to medical school at St. George University School of Medicine, and that was in the West Indies. How fascinating. And then she did her residency at University of Texas. She came here and she didn't want to leave. That's what happens. That's why our population keeps on growing. Those kids at UT, they come from all over the state of Texas, all over the world, and they don't leave. They love it here, and we're happy. Uh, she had fellowship at University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Her professional memberships are IDSA and Texas Medical Society. We are so excited to have you here today from Baylor Scott and White. And uh, I'm going to go off screen if you will unmute yourself. Hey. Hi. Nice. So how do you say your last name? So it's Theo Tisto. So Dr. Theo is usually. Oh, uh, I like that. Dr. Theo. But they probably think they're going to see a guy. Don't you think, Theo? You're like, no, I'm Katie, Dr. Katie yeah. Theo. <laughs> well, we are so happy that you are here. We're going to just let you take the stage. If you need to share screens, you're perfectly yeah. welcome to do that. And like I said, I'm going to go mute and go off video for you to take the stage. Okay, I am going to share my screen. If I It. Let me know if you can see it. Yes, I can see it and it's not showing your notes. So it's perfect. Okay, perfect. So I decided to make it just a PowerPoint. I'm a visual learner. Um, and so I think with COVID-19, it's good to see some of the statistics uh, that go along with it. Um, so let's get started. I kind of, there were some questions that uh, 
I thought maybe everybody might have and kind of am going to just go over COVID-19, give an update. I think a lot of this you'll have heard. I hope that some of it is new to you and new information. Um, you know, repetition is always important, so it never hurts to hear things again. Uh, so we'll go over COVID-19, a little bit about transmission and prevention, what to do during travel um, if you travel, and then it is flu season now, so I thought it would be important to mention that, and then updates on treatment and vaccines. And of course, the one question a lot of us have, do we have immunity? Um, so this is as of the other day, and this is information that I got from the CDC, but in the United States, total case number is 7.1 million, um, and then the total death rate is over 200,000. And then as you can see, I put on two graphs down here, and the graph that's in the red is showing the burden of disease by age group. And so the higher, the highest burden of disease is actually in younger people, 18 to 29 year olds. And you can kind of see a nice bell curve happening there where it's not so frequent in young, young children um, and not as frequent in the elderly population. But then when you compare um, burden of disease to death rates by age group, you can see that as you get older, you have increasing likelihood of death from the virus. Um, and that's shown here in this next trend. And so kind of, you know, one question people have been asking is, why are elderly people more likely to have severe disease? A lot of these questions are still being answered. And so there's still studies out there and investigations since this is still new virus, we're learning as we go. But it is thought that um, it's due to comorbidities. So as we get older, we have more comorbidities. Um, and then as we get older, our immune systems do naturally weaken. And so it's thought that the combination of these things leads to the likelihood of developing cytokine storms. And this is the idea that we get a lot of inflammation and that inflammation actually is what results in life-threatening uh, respiratory failure and illness. Um, and then there's also this thought that as we get older, um, since our immune systems are weaker, that we, it takes a lot longer to to clear the virus. Um, and this delay in clearance may actually persist and lengthen the disease process. So those are kind of the leading theories right now on why elderly people have more severe disease. Um, this is another graph that I pulled from the CDC, um, just kind of showing you know, risk of hospitalization related to underlying medical conditions, so your comorbidities again. And you can see, um, you know, people with asthma, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, if you have chronic kidney disease, um, you have a much higher risk of having an admission to a hospital. And if you're admitted to a hospital, we know you're sicker and you have more severe disease. And so if you have two conditions, your risk of having a hospital admission is 4.5 times higher compared um, to the control population, which I think was 18 to 29 year olds. And then if you have three or more conditions, you're five times more likely to have a hospital admission. And then this compares the hospitalizations and death rates again by age group. It's just reifying the fact that the younger folks, although the burden of disease is here more in the 18 to 29 year olds, and um, that's our comparison group, as you get older, you're more likely to have a hospitalization and you're more likely um, to have a bad outcome such as death. And so I'm just gonna go over symptoms again. It never hurts to hear these symptoms. Um, we all know them, we've been seeing them, you know, since the pandemic started, uh, but it's fevers, chills, cough. You can develop shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. A lot of viruses cause muscle aches. And so that's kind of, you know, you feel bad all over. Um, kind of unique to COVID is the loss or change in taste and smell. Um, and you can also get GI symptoms with COVID, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which seems pretty common. These usually occur uh, two to 14 days from exposure. And then of course, you know, how, how severe it gets, it just depends on the person. But since flu season is coming, I wanted to compare those symptoms to flu symptoms and they're very similar. Um, and so same things, you get fever, cough, shortness of breath, you can get runny nose, um, the muscle or body aches, headaches, fatigue, and you can get GI symptoms with influenza as well, vomiting and diarrhea. 
we all know this. Um, transmission is spread primarily through respiratory droplets. Here's a person showing you six feet. Um, the reason for six feet is that when you cough out a droplet, it's heavy. And so you like, you think of when somebody sneezes and you see this particles coming out, they're just heavy. And so they end up dropping by the time, um, you know, three to six feet from a person. But there's newer data coming out that suggests there are scenarios where the virus can be airborne and we're still learning more about that. But we think those potential places are gonna be crowded and poorly ventilated areas. And so those are places where there's loud talking, yelling or singing. Um, and to kind of make that point, there was this case study of an outbreak after a choir practice, and you have an index case, this is the red case. So this is the symptomatic person. Nobody else had COVID, but after choir practice, almost everybody got COVID. Um, and so it just kind of reedifying the point of making sure you stay socially distant. If you're gonna be in a crowded area, make sure you wear a face mask. Um, and then if you have to be indoors and it's crowded, make sure it's well ventilated, you're wearing a face mask and distance yourself as much as possible. So again, just reedifying the point um, on how to protect yourself. We keep saying face mask and that reason is really this droplet and potentially airborne transmission. Um, it's gonna protect you from spreading it to other people and it's gonna protect you from getting it as well. But uh, wash your hands, continue to socially distance, um, you know, wear a mask like I've been saying, clean and disinfect frequently touch surfaces. So, you know, I clean my car, the steering wheel, um, you know, make sure you clean your counters frequently, wherever you're frequently touching and then monitor your health daily. So it's important, you know, if you're starting to feel under the weather, maybe you shouldn't go out and go grocery shopping. Maybe you should have somebody else do it for you. Um, this guy here on the corner, he's coughing into his hand. Don't do that. Uh, cough into your arm, wear a mask, cough into the mask. Um, but coughing into your hand is going to spread germs. This is emphasizing the point that wearing masks helps. So this is just a case study on two hairstylists actually that were COVID positive and symptomatic. They wore masks. All their clients wore masks, so they exposed to 139 clients, none of their clients got COVID because everybody wore a mask. And so that's just another way to look at how important wearing masks is. So I know I was thinking about this uh, when I was asked to talk and we're kind of coming up on holiday season. And so in, I know at least here, we haven't had as much transmission. Um, but COVID isn't gone. And so if you're planning to travel and you're thinking about traveling, you need to think long and hard about it, especially if you're somebody who's a little older and you have a lot of comorbidities. And so you really need to think about the destination, like how, you know, what is the COVID situation where you're going? Is there a lot of transmission? Is there a lot of transmission here? Would I potentially be spreading COVID? Uh, to said destination. And then who are you gonna go visit? Are you gonna go visit other people with weakened immune systems, young children who aren't vaccinated, maybe they're going to daycare. So you really need to think about it. Um, and then how many people, if you're staying in a family home, how many people are also gonna be in that family home? And so you really just need to think about it and plan ahead. Um, and if you feel like the risk is too high, then you need to make the decision to stay home. And then also just think about travel restrictions too. There are places that have a lot of travel restrictions um, and make you quarantine if you get there. So also think about that ahead of time. Um, there are a lot of vaccines in development. Uh, worldwide, there's over hundred and 43 of them are currently in clinical trials. I don't have much more information about this. Um, the three that we're looking at and you're hearing about in the news a lot, they're all in phase three, and that's the AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccines. We don't have any data on their efficacy yet because they're not out of phase three, and we don't have much data on their safety profiles yet. So it is unknown when these are going to come out. We are hoping that by the end of this year or early 2021, that vaccines will be safe and effective and available for the general population. There are two vaccines out, the Russian and Chinese vaccines you may have heard about, 
Neither of them completed phase three trials, so the efficacy is unknown. Um, again, there's not much in the way of treatment options. Everything is under investigation right now. But what we know and we think is potentially helpful are the use of steroids in severe disease. So when somebody's requiring oxygen, um, convalescent plasma. And so that's where you're getting blood products from another person and you're potentially getting the antibodies that they've developed for COVID and that may help fight off COVID faster in your body. There's some promising data with that that's still under investigation and the final data probably won't be available for some time. The other drug that's been under investigation that seems to have some benefit in getting people better quicker is remdesivir. Um, that's reserved for people with severe disease right now because it's only available intravenously. So you have to be admitted to the hospital to get it. Um, so again, all of these are being studied uh, for their efficacy and best timing for effectiveness. So as this pandemic progresses, we'll learn more and more. We're all becoming experts every day on COVID and we're learning new things daily. Um, and so immunity, you know, the question is how long do we have immunity and when do we develop immunity? We know that after you get COVID disease, you generally develop antibodies within a couple of weeks. You usually elicit a stronger antibody response the, severe, the more severe disease you have. So you're more likely to develop antibodies if you have severe disease. Um, the more recent data for this appears that the antibody levels start to decrease within a few months after the infection. Um, it's unknown how long they last. We think that the antibodies last at least three months. So the newer data is suggesting that you can get reinfected after three months from your first illness and there have been reinfections reported. And that's just important to know. And that's also why it's still important, even if you've had COVID or you've been exposed to COVID, um, that this pandemic is not gone. And so it's important to continue to protect yourself and protect others around you. So keep wearing that mask. Um, really the only thing I can say about this is social distancing and mask wearing, but make sure you get your flu shot. Um, as I told you earlier, the symptoms for flu are very similar to COVID. You don't wanna get COVID and the flu because you're probably gonna get really sick. So we have effective flu vaccines. So it's important to get that because that's one thing you can definitely do and that'll minimize that risk of getting a severe influenza infection. Um, and then just continue social distancing as best you can and wear masks, especially as we're getting colder now, a lot of our activities are gonna move indoors. And it's that indoor transmission risk that, you know, we're all concerned about in the medical community, especially if we're putting ourselves in scenarios where this virus is potentially airborne. That's what I have for you. So I don't know if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer anything. Oh, I'm just, I'm going to come back on. Um, we'll look through here and see if we have any questions. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Are you at the Baylor Scott and White in Lakeway or where are you? I, I am based at Baylor Scott and White in Lakeway. Um, my partner is in Round Rock. So okay. there are two of us for Baylor Scott and White that cover Austin and we cover other hospitals remotely. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so my mom right now is in Round Rock actually, and she is working uh, with your group there. So okay. um, she has had the COVID test five times. She's been in for 14 days. So I guess what she was saying is each time she goes to a different department or a different area in the hospital, they want to test for COVID. Is that mm -hmm. right? Just sure that she's COVID free before they take her for, you know, radiology or. You know. Right. And, and so that's more an infection control thing. And so what you don't want to do is take somebody out of appropriate isolation precautions and having them travel around the hospital potentially exposing other people. Right. So that's more of an infection control thing. And that's specific to Baylor's common life. Well, I appreciate that because I think it's making everybody um, safer. So we have a question here. Is Baylor Scott and White offering flu shots to the public? I believe they are, yes. Yes. So They're I think- I can provide you that information. Don't okay, worry. well, maybe, I think probably um, some of your team is on and maybe they can put it in the chat for us. Okay. Um, how dangerous is it to take the COVID test? Somebody was saying to me, you know, they go up through into your membrane and there's a potential for um, popping the membrane or I'm sure that there's terrible things that can happen, but just how risky is it, would you say? 
Well, you know, that's how you get tested for influenza or other respiratory viruses as well. The, um, the swab is very thin and very flexible. I think the risk is very, very low. Okay. It's designed, there's a marker on it and it's designed to go up a certain amount. And yeah, you do have to swallow it around, but it's the same swab that you use for influenza. And oh, it is. Okay. How long is it taking now if you have the test to get a result? Just a pretty quick turnaround and it depends on the platform you're using. Okay. Uh, at our institute, we have a rapid test that the sensitivity is a little lower on. Uh, but it's still very good. And that one is, I think, a few hours. Um, and then the more sensitive PCR is, I think the turnaround's a day. We don't do them on site in Lakeway. They go, I think they go up to Round Rock or Temple. And so there's going to be a little bit of a delay for travel. But it's it's a lot quicker than it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. it was do you, sometimes, so. so right now, today, are there any COVID patients in the Baylor Scott and White in Lakeway? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Have you had, have you had COVID? There, there have been COVID patients admitted. I don't know the current data numbers. Um, I do get called on them occasionally. I have, okay. not, I have not gotten recent calls. So I do not have that current information. Okay. Hey, Karen, I'm gonna take you off video for right now. She's getting logged on. She's one of our speakers. So I'm just gonna stop her video if I can figure that out. Um, when you have a COVID patient at Baylor Scott and White in Lakeway, where were they going? Are they on a separate floor? Do you have a different area? Are they intermixed? Kind of, how do you handle that? So for the severe COVID patients that need ICU level of care, there is a separate area for them. Um, there's just higher risk of airborne with some procedures. So they, had, they were separated. Um, the ones who have mild disease, they're, there's, they're separated, but they're on the same floor as regular patients. Um, are people still going on ventilators or what is the thought on ventilators at this point? When you get very severe disease and you're not able to oxygenate just with the nasal cannula that you see on people, um, you, you need ventilators. So the short answer is yes, people are still getting severe disease. Um, and I don't know what our numbers are at Baylor Scott and White as far as people needing respirators, uh, but overall over, around the world, yes, people are still getting severe disease. And do you, um, oh, I had another question. Do you have enough ventilators for so far for the people that have come in? Do you have the supplies, I guess, that you need, the PPE? Because we hear there's not supplies and nurses are having to reuse things. And are we seeing that in our area or do you feel like the supplies are good or give us some people? I feel like our supplies are good. I don't know our numbers, um, but I don't think we've had a shortage recently to my knowledge. Okay. Um, gosh, I'm looking to see if there's any other question or answer. How long have you been, oh, can, can it be transmitted through the eyes? That's a great So question. Yeah, that is good. So if somebody is coughing at you um, and your eyes are exposed or you rub your eyes after touching a contaminated surface, potentially it can get in your membranes. Uh -oh. So don't touch your eyes, you know, after touching. Dr. Theo, you uh, froze. <laughs> Dr. Theo, you froze. So um, if you could re restate that again. So the question was, um, what happens if somebody it, can you get it in your eyes? So short answer is yes. Um, if somebody's coughing directly at you with infected particles, or if you touch your uh, hands to your eyes and your hands are contaminated. So wash your hands, you know, wear your mask. Yeah. Away. So, so potentially, yes. Are there any areas that we don't think about getting contaminated on that you want to tell us about? So we go to the grocery store, we have the handle, you know, all that stuff that, that I kind of know, but what are some other kind of surprising areas that you might be able to get it from? I feel like people forget about their phones. Oh yeah. They don't forget that your phone probably does need cleaning. Right. Um, you know, there have been studies about food packaging. It doesn't seem like the virus lasts that long on uh, plastic and cardboard surfaces and the risk of transmission from food packaging is, is very low. So we don't think that that is a big concern. But if you're concerned about your groceries, um, you can leave them on the counter, but you should, perishable items, you should put away within two hours. 
disinfecting. I know there's been a lot about disinfecting your groceries. Yes. There's no data on disinfectants for porous packaging like cardboard. Okay. Um, and so we don't know if that helps or not. Okay. How about mail? Should you spray your mail or what do you think? Uh, probably again, it's a porous surface. So the best thing to do if you're concerned would just be leaving it alone for a few days before. Or I guess you could handle it with gloves and be out at your garbage can and you handle, can just handle throw it with it gloves, when, hand sanitizer yeah. when you're done, because you're not going to be breathing in, in particles from that. That's more of a touch, like a contact. I'm seeing where um, people, well, when I go into the Baylor Scott and White, they don't want me as a visitor to wear gloves as I come in. So yeah. what is that thought, do you think? So gloves are effective when you use them appropriately in settings that are controlled, like in a hospital. So when I go into a room and I use gloves, I'm using them in that room with that person and I'm done with them. And I'm still doing hand hygiene before I put on the gloves and after I put on the gloves. What I've seen when people use the gloves outside of a controlled setting and trained setting is you'll put on your gloves, you'll use your shopping cart, you'll touch something, you'll pick up your phone, you'll pick up your credit card, you'll look through your purse. So in that kind of a setting, it doesn't work because you're touching, touching, touching. Um, and you're not using it in a controlled setting. So that's why it's not recommended. It is though, if you're caring for somebody who is sick, recommended to use gloves and if, um, if they're immunocompromised as well. So in those kind of home settings, it is recommended. Well, this has been fascinating. I appreciate you sharing all the information and the data and taking time. I know you're super, super busy. It was so nice to meet you. How long have you been at the Baylor Scott in Lakeway? I've been here since July. Oh yeah, my the pandemic. Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. Where'd you come from? San Antonio. San Antonio. Okay. Mm -hmm. So are you living here in the area now in the Austin area? In the Austin area. Not That's too far. It's a, it's a lovely area. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here and thank you so much for having me talk. It was Absolutely. A pleasure. Um, and as far as getting like where the flu shots are offered, we, I, I'll send you something if my team doesn't send. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, if they could, um, maybe you could just ping them and say, put it in the chat today. So yes. <laughs> thank you again. We really appreciate you. It was nice meeting you. Thank you. It was nice meeting you too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so what is next on our agenda? I'm going to our time frame here. Um, so now we are getting into our lunch bites. Our lunch bites are going to start in just a minute. What I'd like to do before we do that is just go to, I have a couple more raffle items. And I wanted to let... Um, I said the wrong person for the how to care for aging parents and moving your aging parents. Uh, that winner should have been Sue and Peter. And I know Sue and Peter. Um, so they have won that bag, not uh, Jay Price, because that would mean that Jay P Price won two, and that did not happen. And so our other gift is, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Shirley, I think I can share my screen while you're sharing yours. I'm not I'm going to go ahead and, and um, you will stop. I'm going to stop your share screen real quick because I want to show the next business that has donated something. And that is, tell me if you can see that, Natalie, if you can see Lakeway Aquatic Therapy is up next. Can yes. you see that? Yes. Okay. So Lakeway Aquatic Therapy, um, I'm actually doing my therapy for my knee through them. They're awesome. Uh, they make you feel like uh, you can do anything, which is what you really need when you're trying to rehab. They really give you, lift you up and give you that positive um, feeling that you can do. You can do it when, when you walk in, you're kind of scrunched and feel kind of bad, but they do lots of different kinds of therapy. They do land therapy, aqua therapy. Um, they also have a workout area. And so what they're giving away is one month complimentary land gym membership and the winner is Bruce M Bruce M and so he'll be able to come in for one month and use um, use their equipment which is really cool uh, our next winner is and I don't need to show this screen I'll go ahead and stop this our next winner is for an HEB gift card and that was from LT senior services so you're going to $25 HEB gift card. And remember, when you come up and get your lunch, you're going to ask for raffle item number nine. And that's from LT Senior Services. So LT Senior Services donated that. And then our last one, let me just go ahead and get that up, is from, let's see, I'll darn it all. It's from me. 
I'll just say it's from me. So Cindy Cummings, <laughs> I'm with Realty Austin and I have a mom. It's a beautiful mom. It's really, really pretty color. And the winner is Diane B. And again, we'll reach out to you. We'll send you an email and let you know. Um, again, I am a real estate agent who specializes in working with seniors. I do not just work in the Lake Travis area. Um, I just got under contract in Wimberley. I've sold in Hedo. Um, Georgetown. I go wherever, where my clients are. I also just wanted to say again, say thank you to the Sensi group. Um, I just ate one of these little candies and already I feel relaxed. It's awesome. And then they have some lotion and I put it on my thumb and my thumb feels better already. And they have those CBD products. They went to a lot of trouble to give us this box of supplies. I have no idea how expensive that was, but I wanted to just thank them again. I also just wanted to reiterate, if you think you have, well, actually, if you don't think you have trouble with sleeping, but most people do think they have trouble with sleeping, you can be in a sleep study through UT and get $300. They really need uh, people to go through this sleep study. You cannot be on a CPAP and your age needs to be 55 to 85. Not only will you get the $300, you'll receive assistance with sleep apnea treatment. And you know, the machines, um, I have one, they're like $600 to buy them. You'll also get a, receive a brain scan and memory test, which is super awesome. So uh, again, you have a flyer for that. If you're not getting a bag and you want more information, let us know and we'll email information to you from UT. Uh, part of that whole uh, process again is the restless leg syndrome. They're also specialists in restless leg uh, syndrome. I know I've gone over my time a little bit. And so um, Hospice Austin, we will give you more time. I'm going to have you come on in, Shirley, and go ahead and start sharing your screen. Uh, what I wanted to do is let you know that you have a packet of information in your bag. And um, Shirley, I think I have unshared my screen. Oh, excellent. So I got sure. it. Okay, we want to see your beautiful face too. So come <laughs> in and show us your video. Um, but um, you have this conversation kit um, that's in your packet of information and super helpful information. Um, and we really appreciate you guys coming. I know you've received a grant. And yes. so your goal is to get out there and to really get the word out about advanced care planning. So um, Shirley, is, is it Shirley that's talking? Yes, it is okay. me. Oh, hey, Shirley. <laughs> hey, you. you. You too. I'm going to go ahead and go off screen. I'm going to stop my video, but I will be here. And if we have questions, I will shoot them to you. Um, we're, these, this is called our lunch bite portion. So she's got okay. about 10 minutes um, to talk. I, I took that. I took two minutes of your time, so I'll give you a little bit more, but we will stop you at that time because we got to get going. So I'm going to no go problem. off screen and I'm going to. Thank you very much. So thank you for joining me today. We have 10 minutes, so I'll make it really quick. Talking about the importance of advanced care planning. So advanced care planning is about doing what you can do now to ensure that the health care treatment you receive is consistent with your wishes and preferences should you be unable to make decisions for yourself due to a car wreck, an illness, or some other life-altering event. An advanced directive is a legal document in which a person specifies what actions should be taken for their health if they're no longer able to make those decisions for themselves. Again, due to some life-altering event, car wreck, many, many, many numerous things. But basically it's taking those decisions made from those advanced care planning conversations with your loved ones and putting them in writing. That's really all an advanced directive is, putting in writing what your wishes and preferences are. It's important to know that choosing to withdraw or not receive treatment does not mean you won't receive comfort care. Comfort care is always provided. So what did these three people have in common? Tom Petty, Joan Rivers, David Bowie, um, they all did their advanced directives before their life altering event. So Tom Petty died October 2nd, 2017 of a cardiac arrest. He collapsed in his home in Malibu. They rushed him to the hospital, immediately put him on a ventilator, life support, in the hopes that he would revive. 
but he never turned that corner. While he was in the hospital, a nurse found his advanced directive form, his out of hospital do not resuscitate form in his pocket. And so they immediately stopped, took him off life support at that moment. And he was 66 years old when he passed. Joan Rivers, and you guys may remember her passing. It was, it, I remember seeing a lot of news articles on it, but she went in for just a basic vocal cord surgery and she stopped breathing and was unconscious. Her daughter, Melissa came in and they had had several conversations about what her wishes are. I remember Joan joking all the time about death. You know, I'm sure you guys remember that. But she was very open about what she wanted. So Melissa came in a week after she had this happen during her surgery. They took her off life support. And she was 81 years old. David Bowie. I remember he died January 10th, 2016. And he died of cancer, but it seemed like we never heard that he was even sick. It just kind of, boom, you know, he passed. Well, to the world, it was a surprise, but to him, it wasn't. He had met with his palliative physician. They talked about comfort care. He planned out every detail of his last days, including, I think, six days before he passed, he put out a new album and a music video. And when he died, he was at home, surrounded by his family and friends and his things, his animals. And his palliative physician has come out and done a lot of talks about advanced care planning and the importance of it. And he uses David as his example. And I remember reading in one article where his palliative physician said that David was the most detail oriented on how he wanted his last days to be. He said, I haven't had a patient be that detail oriented, but he certainly was. And he was 69 years old when he passed. So you can choose your own path, basically. The picture on the left is of a hospice facility outside a hospice facility in San Francisco. B.J. Miller is a palliative physician and he helped create the Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco. They have an inpatient facility kind of like we do with Christopher House. And when someone passes and the gurney's being rolled out through the garden, everyone stops. Staff comes out, family, family of other patients there, friends, anyone. They stop and they take rose petals and spread it over the body. And many times he states that they talk about the patient and tell stories or just stand there in, in silence, but that this ushers in grief with warmth and perhaps closure for some. Now you contrast this with the picture on the right of the ICU hospital room. Stark floodlights, kind of like in here. Beeping of machines, despite that the person is no longer living. Staff rushing around, picking stuff up. I mean, as an onlooker, it can seem like no one ever existed. Hospitals were designed for acute trauma and treatable illnesses. They weren't designed for end-of-life care. And I actually attended um, a friend's husband who was, who was being taken off life support. And, and it really is like that. After he had passed, the staff was everywhere, pulling everything out. And it was just very chaotic. So you have the conversation starter kit in your folder. And basically this is a little booklet that will tell you, or not tell you, I'm sorry, ask questions to help you discover what your wishes and preferences are. It even helps you with what environment you wanna be in to talk about your advanced care planning wishes. So uh, one gentleman called me and said, I read the book, I attended your presentation, and what I decided to do is take a walk with my son 
We walk all, every Saturday, 12 to 2 at Town Lake. He said, we didn't look at each other, but I talked about my wishes. And I said, that's amazing. And he said, it just helped for me to be able to put my mind at ease that my wishes will be followed, what my wishes are. And so there's no right way or wrong way to do this. And if you can do it like this gentleman in one conversation, that's amazing. Uh, for my family, it was five. <laughs> I mean, you talk a little bit about what your preferences are, and then maybe you take a few days and people think about it and come back and meet again. So there's no right way or wrong way to do this. It's just starting the conversation. Um, I will say that I read an article by, oh, am I, is it time? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm muted, sorry about that. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you for the conversation starter kit too. Yes. And do you want to put in the chat some ways that they can learn more about your program? And um, do you have any seminars or webinars coming up? We do. Once a month, we have them um, on the first Thursday of the month. We have a presentation 12 to 1 that a nurse facilitates and goes through to the directives. And also the second Thursday of every month, 12 to 1, they do a deep review of the forms and we help people guide them how to fill them out. You so, don't have to go to a lawyer for this. No, you, you don't. This all, I mean, I have people who have like a power of attorney that's six pages long. Yeah. You know, and I had a client who was in uh, rehab who had a power of attorney done with the staff right there, got it signed, and it was yeah. pages. Yeah. So um, thank you for that. How can people yeah. sign up for that? So all they need to do is email me. And okay. I guess I could put it in the chat. Yeah, just put your information in the chat. Um, I don't see any. Um, any questions uh, right now. So we're just going to move on. But if you put your contact info and the information about your upcoming webinars, that'd be terrific. Hey, thanks, Cindy. Thank you. If you'll unshare your, um, oh, your screen sure. just in case. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Our you. next speaker is Karen Ballinger and she is from LT Community Library. I forgot to introduce uh, Shirley, I'm so sorry about that. Shirley is with Hospice Austin, uh, the gift project, and she's an advanced care planning director for Hospice Austin grant project entitled the gift project. It's giving instructions for tomorrow. And she's been an employee of Hospice Austin for 13 years prior to becoming the director for the gift project. She met with her patients and their families to assist them in their time of need. She received her BSAS from Texas State University. Prior to Hospice Austin, Shirley started a company that assisted homeowners with their home insurance claims. That morphed into working for attorneys who were litigating for the right of homeowners. And she worked as a private investigator, participating in undercover buys and trade infringement and counterfeit cases. Very interesting. Well, now we have Karen. Karen, come on in, unmute yourself and uh, show us your beautiful face. Karen is with the Lake Travis Community Library and Karen Ballinger has been working as the outreach library at the Lake Travis Library since 2016. Her role at the library involves reaching out to those in the community who might not be aware of or unable to access library services generally with the library bookmobile. Before working at the library, Karen worked at the University of Texas at Austin Administrative Mainframe System and has lived in Austin for 20 years. Karen, welcome. Tell us more about the library. I'm going to go away and let you have your time and uh, just tell us what's going on at the library. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Cindy, for doing this. We really appreciate everything that you're doing for the community. Uh, we, the library has been a benefit of some of the food that Lake Travis Senior Services has gotten together. So our patrons really appreciate it. So yeah, I've been um, attending the great webinars that Lake Travis Senior Services has hosted. So you probably heard a lot about the library, but the point of this talk is just to hopefully tell you something that you might not have known about the library. So that's why it's in gems or learn something new. And just to be clear, I'm sure you all know this, but this is the library in Lakeway on Lomans Crossing, uh, across from the police station on the another police station was built across the library. That's okay. Anyway, a lot of people say that they love, you know, the paper books and they love the books, but we do have a digital library and it's through Overdrive and um, an application called Libby. 
So even though you love the books and I do too, sometimes it's nice to get this applications because you can read books and audiobooks for free on your device. And one of the benefits is that you can change the text size of the font of what you're reading and you can also change like the brightness. You can change the brightness on your device, but you can also get this black background with white. And I love that because if I wake up in the middle of the night, I can read in the dark without having to turn on a light. So I don't see anybody. Hey, but Karen, so we're having some benefits. Karen, we're having a what little happened? bit of trouble hearing you. So I don't know if you can oh, get okay. closer to your mic or do something like that, but we're having just a tad trouble. Can you sorry, can you hear me better now? Oh, absolutely. Is this any better? That's awesome. Okay, yeah. I also talk really fast, so please feel free to interrupt at any time. Okay. The other thing, the good thing about the digital library is that the books just, they check out, but they disappear. You don't have to worry about returning them. Uh, the, another thing the library has is magazines. So you may have come to the library and browse magazines, but you can check them out and you can reserve them. So uh, we can talk about how you do that later, but you can also get magazines digitally also on Libby. So there's lots of different ways. So we, we're still getting the magazine subscription. So you can check out like the latest issues of your favorite magazines. We also have audiobooks. So um, a lot of times people say they're having trouble reading. And so some these are books that will read the book to you. Also, it's nice because if you're doing something like you're shelving a lot of books, which we've been doing here at the library, um, it's something that you can listen to while you're crafting or doing something else. We have the books on CD that you can check out from the library. A lot of people used to use those for your commute, for their commutes, and you can also get those on Overdrive. So uh, you can see there's that star there. It'll say audio next to the item. Hopefully, you know, we also have mobile hotspots that you can check out. So these are little devices. They look like that. They're about half the size of your cell phone. Um, they're basically a Wi-Fi signal from a cell phone tower, right? But it's not going to use any of your data. It's totally free through the library. So um, yeah, you can check them out for two weeks. These have been pretty popular. We've heard stories of people doing their virtual classes from a college. They got stuck in a traffic jam and they were able to attend their vir their college virtual class like from the car while someone else was driving. So we know internet is super important right now with everything that's happening. So we have 30 of these now that people can check out. You can reserve them and they check out for two weeks. So free unlimited Wi-Fi. Um, and we also just got a Wi-Fi extender in the parking lot. So we've always had Wi-Fi in the library and like close to the building. We have a lot of people who We'll sit outside and use the Wi-Fi and it's always it's it's totally open. There's no password required, but we just got an extender. So hopefully the signal is even stronger in the parking lot now. So again, we want to be a resource for internet resources and you know internet access. And then just incidentally, for those of you who are familiar with the library, you may have remembered before all COVID happened, the library closed for a day or two last year, and because we were trying to get the parking lot repaved. So because the entire planet shut down, we were actually able to get the parking lot repaved. So that picture of the parking lot is after it was freshly repaved and any future library shutdowns will not be to schedule a parking lot repaving, at least in the next few years. So with all this internet access, um, the library also has a ton of digital resources that you can get from home with your library card. So this is a picture of our catalog page. And when you log in, I don't know if you can see in the top right corner, I'm logged in with my library account. You get access, you can look for books and everything and magazines and all that, but you also on the left-hand side, there's this electronic resources. And we've added a few, there's always been some available and we've added more in the closure. Um, so one thing that got added in the closure is Ancestry.com. So we always had genealogy on Friday mornings and you could use Ancestry in the library, but now since somebody's in the library, no patients are in the library right now, uh, you can get it at home for free. So if there's something you're wanting to do at home, you could do some genealogical, which I can't pronounce properly, research. Let's see. Also, you, if you're looking for something to do, you can try, you can learn a new language with Mingo Languages. This is something we've also had, so you can, yeah, learn a language, you know, there's some, I think, I feel like this is a good time to do those things you've always wanted to do, but never had time to do. And in Mango, I will point out, you could learn either Pirate, they have classes in Pirate, and also Shakespearean English. So if that's something you're interested in, and all these other languages that are listed. We also have, through the Texas State Libraries, a database called Learning Express. 
So there's a job career accelerator, you know, there's information on building resumes, looking for jobs. They also have a computer skills center and college prep um, that you can go through and look at on your own. Am I running out of time, Cindy? Yeah. Don't you wish we had this oh, for the presidential debate? Because I could just mute you or take your video off. Didn't we need that on Tuesday? <laughs> Good heavens. Somebody has that. Okay, I'm yeah. almost done. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we have new resources, books for online resources. We have value line for anybody who remembers like looking through the paper, you can now do it online through the library. We have online presentations. We have a speakers forum that's happening once a month. Um, it's just like the great decision speakers that we used to have. And then we also have technology help. So Wednesdays at 1030 on Zoom and you can email the library at techcoach.latecounterslibrary.org if you're looking for technology help. So the library building is not open right now, and I will say that we don't know when it will open, but you can get materials through curbside reserve pickup. So you can reserve them. When you get the notification that they're ready, you can pick them up in front of the front door. We've got that going Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday from 11 to 3, and Wednesday happy hour from 5 to 7. And then you can do the same service at the bookmobile that we take everywhere in the community, like outside, like to the farther regions of our library district. And we also have homebound delivery. So if you're at home for a medical reason, we'll deliver a bag of library materials to you once a month. So yeah, this is our library staff. And we're all excited Woo! to get our library cards. We'd love to answer any questions. You can contact us, like travislibrary.org, but we, we're here to help you out. Thank so you, Karen. I didn't see if there's it's any questions or anything. Yep, uh, uh, Morgan's been answering them in the chat. So I think we're good. So you have a good okay. partner there. Karen, thank you so much. I think it's uh, good that you do talk fast because you got a lot of info there. I just had a question about Ancestry.com. So can I cancel my membership and use yours or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's free through the library with your library account. So I would definitely like try ours through your library account and see if you're yeah. getting all the features that you had. Yeah, you but then, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Then Karen, can, it was so good yeah. to see you. And uh, thank you so thank much. You. We're going to have our next speaker come in. And thank you for unsharing your slides. Um, Deepak, are you there? <gasps> there you are. I am indeed. Oh, it's been so long since I've seen you. I know. This whole it's... COVID thing is crazy. Uh, I appreciate oh. you having me on. Like, this is amazing. Like, the stuff I just learned about the library is crazy. I know. You can rent Wi Fi. Hello. <laughs> so, so cool. It is cool. Well, I'm just going to introduce you real quick, but we'll look at yeah. your smiling face. So um, after going to 15, over 15 Tony Robbins events, I finally understood what the next chapter was going to be about, and that's contribution. In November of 2017, I happened to walk by a booth at an event that had some pretty high-tech equipment. I stopped by to check it out. They were telling me how it was designed to naturally improve bone density, and reverse osteoporosis. I immediately pictured my mom and I thought, wow, she could really use this. Then they started talking about the other benefits of osteogenic loading, like helping eliminate fibromyalgia, reduce and eliminate chronic joint and back pain, and also reverse type two diabetes. In my head, I was thinking about my mom and saying, check, check, check. I have to get my mom to an osteo strong center. There wasn't one in Austin. That's when it all fell into place. The universe had put this in my path at the perfectly right time. Six months later, I resigned my 20 year career in technology and operations and opened my first osteo strong of which I am a member with my 83 year old mother. And uh, in the time that we were there, we saw a great improvement with her. And we are really sad that we haven't been able to come back just because of her um, no, issues I get that it. she's going on right I get now. It. So, like that's, that's one of the first questions that I want to ask the audience. Like how many people, if you can put in the chat uh, a why for, are you concerned about your health, COVID, your bones? Are, are you concerned about any of those three things? If you are, just put a, put a why in the chat. Uh, okay, a, a I'm checking the chat to see what people are saying and I'll let you yeah. know. Or uh, you can put a Y in the chat if you're awake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they are because they're asking other questions. Oh, I got a Y. We got a Y. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm worried about all three. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I know that uh, it's not just you. Uh, it's me too, right? Because I have parents and this isn't going to be a, a presentation. I'm just going to tell you a story. And I'm going to tell you a story about uh, what we're doing now and like, what, what am I responsible for, right? So I'm responsible for 
my parents. I'm responsible for my neighbors. I'm responsible for a couple hundred of our members at our center for their health. And right now, as you can imagine, health is like at the epicenter of everybody's mind saying, okay, I need to stay healthy. I need to stay healthy. I need to stay healthy. And I'm going to stay at home. I'm going to avoid this. I'm going to put a mask on. I'm going to do this, 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 and that. But there's one big thing that's really missing in the media coverage. It's, well, outside of wearing a mask and outside of social distancing, what else should I be doing, right? And the answer is, is you should be doing everything you can to strengthen your immune system. It's not just about sitting on the couch and trying to wait this out, waiting for a vaccine, right? COVID is not the only thing we're gonna face in the next 10 years. There's other types of flu, there's other illnesses. The one thing that you have control over is your immune system. So ask yourself, like, what are you doing to strengthen your immune system other than avoiding the things that could get you sick? So that's one strategy, but I wanna couple that strategy of avoiding getting sick with, if you do get sick, let's strengthen your immune system to the point to where you're not gonna get as sick as you possibly could because you're eating the right things, because your mindset is clear, because you're exercising in a way that is strengthening your entire body. So that's one thing I just really wanna get across to everybody is that wear the mask, stay safe, social distance, but focus on what you're putting in your body, focus on what you're putting in your mind and focus on exercising. Like those three things will have a massive impact on your immune system. And we all know that intuitively, but it's, it, it's awesome how sometimes the obvious escapes us. Does that make sense? I hope this, uh, I hope that that helps. So what we tell our members is that a lot of our members have a proactive mindset of, hey, I want to come here because I want to avoid breaking a bone. Or, hey, I want to come here so I can improve my balance or get rid of pain or get rid of fibromyalgia. But then there's also folks that come in because they just have this proactive mindset that they know that if they strengthen the body, they strengthen their immune system. So whatever they face in the future, they're going to be well, well equipped for that. Uh, so why do some people do it? Right. So, you know, I could ask Cindy, you know, why did you come in to begin with? And yeah, wh why'd yeah. you come in? Well, I think, um, I really came in for my mother. I, I, mm -hmm. I used the excuse to come in for myself and I brought my mother with me. And then once we learned a little bit more about the process that you could go through to get strong and she was very weak and she wasn't going to have to lift, you know, 300 pounds of weight and do all this yeah. crazy stuff, but she was going to see a result in a way that was appropriate for somebody for her age and also appropriate for me. We were both sold. We immediately said, okay, we're going to do this together. And we were doing great till COVID, you know, then COVID hit and, and uh, y'all had to close, which was sad. And, and yeah. now we have illnesses that make it be that we can't come in. But I think um, it was the ability to see her improve, but yet not do it in a way that would hurt her physically. So that's. So, the, so uh, if she improved, like, mm -hmm. what does that enable her to do? Uh, well, we want to do more traveling together. We yes. did a lot of traveling before yes. and she had had no, pneumonia uh, in November. And so she was very weak. And so we just wanted somehow to get her strong, yeah. but didn't think that it was appropriate to go to like a gold's gym, you know? And this is, this is the one thing that's common for all of our members is because they're coming in for various reasons, but they all want the same outcome. And the outcome is they want more magic in their life. Hmm. For you and your mom, it's traveling. For others, it's, you know, playing, like I'm gonna have a picture of my mom right here and we've got two puppies and she's like, this is part of her magic. And then up here, this is also part of her magic. These are her grandkids. She wants to be able to keep up with them. She wants to be able to ride bikes and walk with them and go on hikes with them, right? They all want more magic. 
but this magic all starts with one thing, your ability to be physically active, to physically fit. And it's not just from a physical mindset, it's also from a mental mindset. Because when your mom, when she goes out traveling, you don't want her thinking about, oh, am I gonna fall? Am I gonna trip? Am I gonna break a hip? So there is a mental aspect to this too. So it's not just a physical aspect, it is both. It is mental, it is physical, and it's, it's spiritual also. I mean, magic. That is what everybody's after. And that's really what's at stake. So when you're thinking about, hey, I'm sitting at home and I'm, I've got my mask when I go out and I social distance, magic is at stake. And if you're not doing anything to improve your immune system, to strengthen your bones, which changes the metabolism in your body, which helps your immune system, all of these things are deeply connected. Like the one thing I want to get across here is what are you doing to improve your immune system? Because that is the only thing you can 100% control. You control you, what goes in your mind, you control what you eat, and you control how active you are. So do you feel like if you have a strong immune system, it's less likely you would be susceptible to COVID? 100%. And that's what they're saying all day long, is that they COVID affects the immunocompromised right? It's the folks that have type 2 diabetes. It's the folks that have, you know, other underlying illnesses. Your body, like our belief is that your body is amazing. It has the ability to heal itself. You just have to send it the right triggers. You have to feed it the right things. You give it the right building blocks and you do the right things. Things magically happen. Your immune system gets better. You don't get the flu anymore. Not that because you've avoided it, it's because your immune system is able to handle it. We are exposed to thousands of viruses all day long. If you're immunocompromised, there's a reason why you go into ICU and you're sheltered from everyone else. It's not just because of COVID. They did this 20 years ago. It's because of every other virus out there. Does that make sense? So you're going to face thing after thing after thing. And the thing now is COVID. But what about five years from now? If you don't do anything to your immune system to improve it, you're going to be susceptible to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And everybody is afraid of this. And I get it. I, under, like, I understand it. I'm afraid for my parents. I'm afraid for my mom. I'm afraid for my dad, my stepdad. They all have underlying conditions. And I'm like, put the alcohol down, put the sugar down. Let's start exercising, eat the right things because that's the only thing you can control. That's what's at stake. Your magic with your mom, your magic with your grandkids, with, with whatever you're doing, your mission in life relies on your immune system. And that's what we're, we're providing. That's what we're, we talk about at OsteoStrong because it is, there's nothing more important than your health. That's it. So if you don't have your health, money it's over. You have in the bank. Yeah. It's over. It's over. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we did a free consultation and are you going to be able to offer that um, to the people who have attended today? Yeah, so what we're doing is, and I'll pop up this other slide so just people can see it. What we're okay. doing is we're doing a free call. Okay. Because now people are worried about COVID, right? Yeah. So there's a free okay. call okay. Uh, for people. If you can put my video up real quick. Uh, so I can't do it. Uh, uh, I see it in your background. Yeah, so if they can, uh, if my video can it's pop up. Enough. Oh, it's big enough? Okay. Uh -huh. It's big. So the easiest thing to do is if you take your phone, open up the camera app, and you just point it at that black box with all the white stuff in it, there'll be a little pop-up on the top of your phone. Oh, it worked. And then you just tap on it, and you can create an appointment to talk to one of our expert coaches to see if what we do is a fit for you. Excellent. It came and up. And we'll do perfectly. all that virtually. 
Yep, it yep. Was great. Well, thank you so Perfect. much. It was so great to see your smiling face. And as always, you're so encouraging. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for having Thanks. me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so we're just uh, ending our event. This has been the first time we've had to do it virtually. We feel that we were able to bring you a variety of different information that will somehow be helpful for you. If you have a friend um, or somebody that you'd like to see afterwards, remember we have our YouTube channel. It's LT Senior Services. You can go there and you can watch all of our videos that we've been posting since we've been live. And I want to give a special thanks to Natalie Harris. Uh, she is our coordinator. She's come back from maternity leave and she just jumped in and really helped us get this event to be so wonderful. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you all to our sponsors, the Arbor at the Terrace. We can't thank you enough. Everybody head up there, get your lunch and get your bags. And if you win big on the lotto ticket, would you let me know? I'll share it. All right. Bye, everybody.